Wir haben, wir haben noch eine Stunde, ihr seid noch eine Stunde später. Okay. Wie bitte? Oh ja. Ah, der Chairman kommt. Our President. Äh, ich sehe in Thessaloniki scheint auch gerade die Sonne. Nicht direkt. Du hast den Laden runtergezogen. Ich habe das werde ich auch gleich machen müssen. Guten Morgen, guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Hallo, Vasco. Hallo, wie geht's dir? Hallo, Vasco. Wie geht's dir? Guten Morgen. Sehr guten Morgen, alle von euch. Danke, weil ich ein wenig zu spät war. Ich bin hier gerade zu Hause. Es ist lustig, weil ich in Portugal war und ich hatte Probleme in der Entrung der Seite. Es passiert. Well, great to see you all. And the great to see you, Professor Fenger. Yes. I'm seeing that you are identified as Papi. Papi, yes, yes, Papi. Which is particularly adequate for this meeting. That's very correct for the meeting because it's Erasmus Papi, Thanasis Papi. My puppy, your puppy, my grandpuppy, my grandpuppy, because I have a puppy. So that's very accurate. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, maybe we should wait five or ten minutes more in order that the others can reach us. But then we should begin because some people need to. To weave a little bit earlier, so yeah. we should keep on time. It's a Saturday. Yeah. Well, a problem that yes. I had is that uh, since in Portugal is one hour uh, sooner than uh, the rest of Europe, 8:30 was a little bit early, special for <laughs> the technician that help us with the transmission. It's a Saturday morning at 8:30. Uh, well, but we were able to manage, and uh, like this, uh, we can do it in, in, the, right, in the right time and uh, uh, with a reasonable uh, the long, the reasonable time uh, to be used for the conference. Well, but, but let me see. Really? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I would uh, only to say that in Greece they are privileged because it is one on one hour later. <laughs> it is ten thirty. Yeah, yeah I did. the I other did. thing, the <laughs> other thing is that we are st we still have some things to do in the university today, unfortunately. So I yeah. have to leave earlier. I, okay. I will miss part of our conference today, unfortunately. Okay. Well, the important part is that we are here to pay an homage to Professor Fenga, and uh, we'll do uh, the best we can in order to be together and work uh, as usual. Uh, by the way, I, I saw yesterday, the conference was very good. Uh, we yeah. talked about lots of subjects. Uh, we uh, provided decisions for the future, for the near future. So I think things were okay. Uh, so it means that we are still alive and the group uh, that was created by Professor Fenga is still working on, which is very good. Well, it, it, we I are hear all from Innsbruck and uh, guten Morgen, Hilma. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Hello, Andreas here from Innsbruck. I have difficulties to hear. What, what did you say? Uh, Andreas from Innsbruck. Good morning, Hilma. Ah, good morning. Ah, good morning, Andreas. Ah, <laughs> to see it. Yeah. yeah, I freue mich auch. Du hast ja gerade eine große Konferenz hinter dir. <laughs> ja, die musste ja leider abgesagt werden und wird jetzt Anfang März wiederholt, hoffe ich. Ja, ich wäre gern dabei gewesen. Ja. <lacht> ja, im März wird das dann hoffentlich stattfinden. Ach so. Ja. Also insofern, aufgehoben ist nicht aufgeschoben, denke ich. 
und das Fest, die Festschrift hast du bekommen. Ja, vielen Dank, vielen Dank. Das war eine große Überraschung. Und, äh, Aber wir wollen hier nicht äh, unterbrechen. <lacht> ja. Nein, wir können ja nachher noch sprechen. Gut, das wäre schön. Ja. Okay, so back to Vasco. Hello. <lacht> Hello, Andreas, how are you? Oh, fine, thanks, Vasco. Nice to meet you. Okay, maybe you. we are already 21. Uh, we should begin. It's, we have 10 minutes after the hour, so uh, perhaps yeah. uh, we could go. Well, uh, it, it seems that I'm the first, and I should introduce you, Professor Fenga, which is something that is really not needed, but uh, it's my task. What teaching and learning, an homage to Professor Fenga. I met Professor Fenga 30 years, 31 years ago, in October 1990, when he invited me to participate in my first Elpis meeting. On arrival at Hanover Airport, Professor Fenger was waiting for me with a large poster in his hand with the colors and the symbol of Europe and the inscription, help me. He took me to the hotel in his car. And when we, he, we arrived, it was about midnight. He asked me if I was too tired with the way of the plane or if I could go downstairs to the bar after five minutes in my room to freshen up, to talk a little bit about the next day meeting. And it was then sitting at the table in the hotel bar with a glass of beer in the hand that Professor Fenger talked to me passionately about his create, creature, his spiritual son, the Alpes Network. If as they say today, in the language of the media of our information society, that a picture is worth a thousand words, the picture of this first meeting characterizes perfectly what Professor Fenger is. As you know, Elpis is the abbreviated name of the English expression European Legal Practice Integrated Studies. But it has a double meaning, as it also means hope in ancient Greek. And it is this hope created by our founding father in 1984 that makes professors and students coming together from every country of Europe and elsewhere for learning and teaching Aiming to, aiming to give to legal education a real European and global dimension, as well as also to contribute to build a Europe and a world of universities in the field of law. The idea of teaching and training European lawyers is part of the Erasmus Sockets program, of which the, the Alpes project was one of the pioneers, but it goes further. For it implies the search for a new methodology and a new pedagogy of law, capable of overcoming the borders of national laws while moving towards a Europe and global legal theory and praxis, the construction of, it, of which constitutes the great challenge, but also the daily work of the Elpis. The expansion and diversification of its activity from academic exchange to pedagogy and research carried out by the Alpes Network to the present day would then lead to the creation of the Alpes Master and the Alpes Research. Professor Ilma Senga, also known by the nickname of Professor Europe, Professor Europa, they said in Germany, it was born in Leipzig on 28th October 1931 and graduated in Heidelberg with a doctorate in law in 1961 and an associate degree in civil law, civil procedure law and legal methodology in 1969. He taught in Heidelberg, Bonn, Mainz, Hamburg, before being appointed professor in Hanover in 1980. His extensive work includes 
not only civil law and civil procedural law, but also legal theory and methodology, international private law, comparative law, European law, and even professional practice and training. This demonstrates his vocation as a jur jurist without borders, not only because of the subject chosen in the most varied fields of the legal encyclopedia, but also because of the language he used, as some of his works were written in a foreign or rather European language, in English, French, and Greek. This encyclopedic and European vocation explains why Professor Fenger became the German member of the scientific committee set up by the European Commission for the Metz Colloquium in 1994, which was devoted to the team of legal education and training in tomorrow's Europe. And it explained why he was elected in 1997 president of newly created Association of Law Faculties in Europe, which has been just had been just created in 1996 in Leuven. Or why he was made Doctor Honoris Causa in the universities of Rouen, the Catholic of Lisbon, Lava, and Thessaloniki. With this academic and human career, Professor Fenger made, an, made of Hanover a real crossover for the law of the countries of Europe and for European law, which reminds us the example of another famous competitor, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, also born in Leipzig in 1646, who first came to Hanover as a librarian after writing his book, New Method for Learning and Teaching Jurisprudence, and will put Hanover on the map of European culture. As it is also of Leibniz and his attempt to reconcile unity and infinity, the personal and universal, with, this, with his theory of the monads, that I remember when I think of what, in the field of law, and keeping all the due differences, Professor Fenger tried to do, seeking to reconcile German law and European law, national and international or global law, European and comparative law, law theory, and legal practice. Professor Fenger, my dear friend Hilma, it is for me a real pleasure and a great honor, as well as a duty of friendship, to introduce you in this conference that the Alpes Network organized for you. And I believe that there is no greater honor to a, for a professor than to be homage by his peers, peers who furthermore, furthermore will, still, will still keep on doing the task of realizing the hope. Thank you very much. And now we have our guest of honor. <laughs> Professor Ilma Fenger is going to do us a uh, speech. I have it here. <laughs> uh, but uh, you listened to him. Uh, it was good that he was here with us today. Uh, and I give him the floor. Thank you very much for the friendly words, more than friendly words. Mr. President, dear colleagues, friends and participants of this special conference. I feel overwhelmed and greatly honored, indeed, by the fact that you came together here, at least virtually, with the intention to discuss an important subject as an homage on my behalf. My sincere thanks and deep gratitude for that. At the beginning of the debate, let me say just a few words whereby I want to stress two general aspects related to the very wording of the conference title itself. 
The first item is concerned with the relation between teaching and learning. The second will look at peculiarities of teaching and learning law in the context of our ASS network. Teaching and learning might be regarded at first sight as completely separate procedures, each one fulfilled by, diff by different persons and normally at different periods of life. Parents are teaching their children by showing them what things are for and how to behave properly. Children receive the message and get it in their brain. The activity is, or at least seems to be, purely one-sided. Parents give and children take the relevant knowledge. But today, we are aware that the mechanism is considerably more complex. This is becoming increasingly obvious when we look at the teaching and learning process in education at a higher level. That is to in schools, drive school, in universities. When I started learning law 17 years ago, mainly in the app of two German universities, who stood in a long-lasting tradition of some hundred, some hundred years, especially famous in the field of law for some outstanding scholars of the 18th and 19th century. In that time, a teaching, one teaching mode was still not unusual that handled the lecture as a lecture in the strict sense of the world. The professor came in, put the manuscript or sometimes even a well-known book written by himself on the cathedra and read the text to separate the safety from the audience, literally, more or less aloud, without any interruption from the beginning until the end of the academic hour. Several years later, I came to face the exact counterpart of this behavior, now demonstrated as the other side by the students in order to be admitted to the presentation of a doctoral thesis, law students coming from a fall to Heidelberg were obliged to take beforehand some courses in German law to the final written examination. In one case, that was my task <coughs> now as a professor to set the exam topic and to evaluate the paper I asked the student to write a small essay on a specific subject in the law of application. The examinee was seated alone in a closed classroom, and after five hours of writing, he handed over to me a 10 pages long manuscript, which looked not so bad. But by nearer inspection, I became aware that the text only repeated word by word, what a colleague had written in a manual application before. Interrogated, the student furnished prima facie evidence that he had learned by heart the whole book and was able to cite pages on whatever subject out of it. By the way, this was not a unique case. Another colleague had been confronted with the same phenomenon by another student, another field of thought. And to be sure, the room was carefully searched before. It was a time when electronic equipment or possible thought were not yet invented. I think we all agree that these two examples do not represent that, what we call, what we would call teaching and learning in the proper sense. 
at least we would not call it good teaching and learning. Certainly, in our quite similar behavior in other situations of our business life, in a scientific conference, usually the relevant speaker will be seen reading a paper aloud in front of the audience, as it did the old professor in the classroom. In order to enable us the communication in foreign languages, we memorize a paper by sheer seeing and hearing words, nothing else, like it was done by the Ezekiel's examinee I reported off just now. But education is different. It's much more than transmission and reception of data. Modern theories of didactic told us that knowledge never can be transmitted in an identical form from one person to the other. But it is always a construction of its own, built by each person individually. And they told us that future communication had to be at the heart of education. Now I come to the point. It was in the light of these ideas the guiding lines for the structure of the exchange facilities within the APIS network emerging in the early 80s became formulated. The RISE advertisement emphasized specifically the character and merits of the students as a huge learning process for the medical course of a patient access. It was founded in the year 1988 in Hanover. Corresponding rules were established. So, students coming from a foreign faculty should be obliged to show already a certain competence, enabling them to meet the others really on the same level. Therefore, they had to have passed at least two study years in their home university and had to possess already sufficient knowledge of the receiving university's language to follow lecture. The incoming students came not in separate classes, but were purposely taught together with the others. A catering common seminar on European legal practice frequently joined by a visiting professor. Was an ideal place for future teaching and learning in future discussion. On the other hand, as to the content of studies, the students were advised, besides rules in law and comparative law, to choose such subjects they could not find also in the program of their home university. That means philosophy, sociology, economy, general theory, methodology of law, etc., public international law as well, did not meet the requirement. Instead, successful participation in at least four classes devoted to the host university national law was explicitly demanded. Hereby, a sufficient input of completely new points of view should be secured over. Of course, with regard to the short period of time spent abroad, the goal could not be that is the legal system of host university as intensely as that of the home country. But the program opens a chance to acquire capacities more and more needed by lawyers in the European market. Comprehension of different ways of juridical thinking, ability to find and familiar sources of law, the certain potency for connecting norms of one legal system with the institutional conditions of another, taking in consideration requirements of the Now, that's it. Um, to the end. The building up of the medical course was a rather ambitious part, ambitious project 
destinated to provide students with quite more than the adventure of a tourist excursion to wonderful places. The whole that of course also but teaching and learning together has been evolved, even some kind of a European spirit. Although later on it became somewhat greater down, water down to scientific studies, the scheme is mainly showing the same future. On the basis of the Rasmus Mundus, the operation field of the Abyss Network, under the leadership of my successors, uh, was a large, widely beyond the borders of the European Union, as it was done especially by the LLM joint degree course on European independence. Nevertheless, apart from the institutional framework, the enduring challenge for good law teaching and learning is still resting in front of us. On to this chapter, special attention is still directed not only by the enduring efforts of our colleague, Klaus Friedrich Germanmann, for instance, recently by the addition of the new book, Innovative Teaching and Learning, Teaching in European Legal Education, and by the present network coordinator, Vasco Ferreira Selva, who initiated, thankfully, the special conference. Thank you all for your attention. I'm very curious and excited to hearing now the speaker's words as well as the debate in your Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so we follow immediately to the panel one. It was a, a very exciting, uh, a very exciting uh, speech. Uh, where we talked about everything we are for uh, and uh, uh, your ideas are still a hope for us and we keep on doing and working on that hope so now in this panel uh, that is named uh, uh, the help is experience from its beginning until today uh, we'll have first an intervention by professor Bern Oberman and then another one from Professor Klaus Friedrich Germann. And I immediately give the floor to uh, the former uh, coordinator of the Alpes Group, Professor Bern Oppermann, my dear friend Bern. You have the floor. Thank you, Professor Vashko. Can you hear me? Is that okay with the audio? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I was supposed to talk about the Alpes experience. Uh, which is, of course, a problem because I can talk about my experience if you, uh, um, if you regard the same uh, subject. Uh, there are, of course, very different, different views about it. Concerning Elpis, I'm glad that Professor Fenger has published an article in the latest, the fifth volume of the International Legal Studies, where he commented on the ambivalent character of uh, the philosophical category HOPE or ALPIS, related uh, to our acronym and to our network, of course, thereby circumscribing the aim of the network. Previs et circumscripta quedam explicatio, so to say. Uh, so I don't need to do that now to get to that category. In order to get down to the ground again, uh, the main purpose for the ELPIS network, of the ELPIS network, founded by Professor Fenger and his colleagues in the 1980s, as he just uh, pointed out, was the provision of bilateral and multilateral research and exchange facilities for law students and law teachers in order to prepare a new generation of jurists for European and international professional practice. Faculties of law almost uh, of all EU member states joined to form the university corporation ELPIS. This is still true to at least a large extent. The organization in its different life cycles was founded by the EU Commission, by the EU support schemes of Erasmus, Erasmus Mundus, 
and indirectly by some others like EUN or Tempus. Elpis, however, survived even as its main source of financing diminished. Today, its existence is based primarily on the cooperation of its publicly, uh, pu publicly fin financed members and their readiness to support it, due to its character as a goodwill network, as it was designed by our dear friend Hilmar Thenge from the very beginning. The activities of ELPIS include the organization of independent elements of European legal training, organizational interaction, and um, a joint European research projects, a number of projects. I had the pleasure to chair the network and its financing for 18 years, uh, pushed incidentally to that part-time job by Professor Fenger again just as if there would not be enough to do regarding the regular devotion of a German law professor. You all know, dear friends, that I might have been pushed into that position, though came to like it. Maybe I even came to love it in a period of um, resistance, national egoism and jealousy. Yet, and more fundamental, the main purpose of, Alpis, of the Alpis network was to help creating a European sphere of higher education. The experiences of national borders, real borders, as well as intellectual fences were to overcome in an aftermath of the war, a post-war experience. Professor Fenge must be mentioned again because my generation had no such experiences. Indeed, he created ELPIS for such high-reaching goals in the course of the 1980 decade. As I learned, other experiences as support for our dear Greek colleagues suffering under a military junta constituted a source of motivation too. Professor Fenger and some colleagues in Greece, France, and Benelux states managed to constitute successfully the first generation of ELPIS activities, so to say, supported by the very first EU Erasmus program. What has brought our institutions and predecessors together was a common European project, more than the old MLE master program only, in order to reestablish European space for higher education, even for the law faculties, which beyond common Roman law tradition, of course, were subject of many regional influences. While for the founding generation, the post-war motivation was additionally viral and as just explained. To conserve and spread such common European goods, we did employ several EU schemes, thereby not excluding non-EU members as Norway, Turkey, Russia, or Switzerland. Um, during my time as chairman, I think the most, uh, the, 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 the utmost surprising um, uh, event was uh, as I was in Brussels once, I had to go very often to Brussels to the commission at the beginning and later on to such a, a suspect agency. Uh, and they opened me, well, it's very nice what you have this, this network of, of European law faculties, but you know the word Erasmus Mundus, that means you need to spread a little bit all over the world and not only stay inside Europe. So we had to open and this was pushed by the European uh, Union, uh, we had to open a network, a worldwide network, to expand our network uh, to other parts of uh, the earth, like to uh, Vietnam, as it was mentioned yesterday, or to Hanoi. Um, uh, other uh, partners brought us um, uh, relationships to China, to specific universities there, like Tongji and Shaotong. Uh, to Thailand, uh, of course, the Portuguese connections to Brazil, and so on and so on. I don't want to list that up now. But uh, that was in my eye one very challenging thing and to report uh, about all that to the Commission. Uh, so that took uh, quite a time, but it was a valuable time. Okay, regarded from this point of reference, 
Now, 18 years of Elvis, of Elvis presidency are the second generation of Elvis, as I mentioned before, Professor Feng uh, constituting the first generation. Um, a notion I should not comment further now. Professor Fenya has entered the 10th centennial of his lifespan very recently with his 19th birthday, 90 birthday and watches the third generation of Elpis activities uh, personalized by Professor Vasco Pereira da Silva for the European Network and by Professor Friedrich Germelmann for the Hanover programs and activities for quite a few years. While I had left some infrastructure and uh, the whole project with its different facets, it became even more successful in their hands. Nevertheless, they experienced another, they will talk about it themselves, I guess, but in my view, maybe the biggest challenge with some national setbacks, where the Brexit constitutes only one example. Um, since one misfortune comes never alone, as there uh, is a saying, uh, the still prevailing pandemic uh, company doubts about the European idea. Thus, the pandemic only topped and strengthened something already pre-existing. Ergo, our successors have to master the most difficult job at present concerning such a European network and the European idea. Professor Vashko did a great job on developing formats of Elpis in the digital world, like online lectures um, or the Elpis V Law Review, a digital scientific journal created in 2020 as a part of Elpis research that alongside Elpis Master integrates the network, the largest teaching and research network in the field of law, as we all know. Also other sources of financing were developed uh, by him, especially concerning uh, the exchange of uh, teachers and students. Due to a slow process of diminishing the appearance of UK law faculties in Elpis, a process starting before the Brexit or uh, COVID disasters. I was delighted by Friedrich Gammelmann's counter-reaction of strengthening and extending the French connection by developing common projects with old and additional new French partners. Maybe to get to another point, the main purpose of Elpis um, was having fun. Fun, yes. An aim not too much to debate about. However, I believe that there will be no development of the European idea without the immediate awareness of the others, which was easy to achieve in the past and due to multiple restrictions, more difficult to realize at present. Moreover, even the awareness of the present pandemic and its restrictive and sometimes confusing countermeasures prove the intellectual necessity to search for relief from densely dawn lockdowns in order to get out of smelly and brain erasing <coughs> and atmosphere and dim light in some of our member states. I still remember it was 20 years ago that a specific brand of colleagues at home uh, warned me from taking too much money and effort into the Elpis network because in their eyes, it was a kind of academic travel agency only. You see. Now, looking back, I would say they were not wrong, but um, great constructions in legal dogmatics could have been achieved by me and forgotten again, utilizing the time instead I, we have invested in performing the different modes of uh, Erasmus Mundus, all wasted. And yet I believe the investment was being worthwhile without trying to impose on you, dear audience, a, a hedonist principle. I'm still convinced that the idea of Europe, of European education and of European science must please its supporters and participants. So to say, it must be fun in the sense of Nietzsche's joyful wisdom or the fröhliche Wissenschaft to bring it in the original tone. Okay, that's so far all I have to say about uh, my experience uh, concerning uh, Elpis. 
uh, it would have been much better, of course, to com communicate that thing in a chocolate factory or at a, a Creer fabric uh, than in this uh, 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 internet uh, version. Uh, it, it's better than nothing, anyway. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you very much, my dear friend Byrne. Uh, uh, your interesting, very interesting speech shows us that uh, things continue going on and that hope can be fun too, which is something really important uh, nowadays and for us that are doing this task. So I give the floor now to Professor Klaus Friedrich Germann. My dear fr friend Friedrich, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Devashko. Um, thank you, Professor Fenger, for giving us this opportunity to um, uh, have another conference uh, in your honor. And let me uh, say at the beginning uh, of my very short remarks um, that for me too, uh, it is mainly a great pleasure to be here. And it's not about uh, it's not just about uh, scientific uh, uh, stringency and scientific um, work, but it's a scientific pleasure basically uh, to be here and to, to be responsible for at least a part of this great invention, this great uh, network uh, uh, concept. Um, when I'm talking about my ELPIS experience, um, and my experience necessarily is compared to yours, a rather short one still, um, taking over the responsibility for the Hanover branch um, was not only an immense joy and enrichment, but it is also, of course, a responsibility and, and a duty um, that concerns both the representation of Hanover in the network, which gives us the opportunity, gives me the opportunity to be with you today and yesterday, but also the responsibility for the partnership in the LLM program that we've got with several of our, uh, uh, of our partner faculties. Um, when regarding the ELPIS experience with well, a view to those two elements, to those branches, you could distinguish between the experience with the network, experience with the students, and of course the uh, corollary duties, um, which in my opinion, all have changed considerably over the decades. Starting with the network, um, we have an ever increasing network. Our network has grown in the last years, um, owing to, of course, our, uh, all of our commitment, but also um, owing to the foundations that uh, Professor Fenger, Professor Oppermann laid, and that Professor Vasco Pereira da Silva is continuing um, with great success in. in Acquiring ever and acquiring new members um, ever since. And um, in my opinion, this ever increasing network is a very good point, a very good experience in our um, ELPIS community. Um, while at the same time, we are still keeping our good traditions and our good working relations, which is necessary in order to keep that network a real network and not just an assembly of people coming together um, uh, from time to time. Um, another development, another experience uh, concerning the ELPIS network is its development from Europe to the world. And Professor Oppermann already uh, talked about the beginnings, the possibly rather thorny start and which, however, has proved to be a very successful uh, endeavor. Um, we are enhancing our international exchange with partners from all over the world. 
while not neglecting the domestic peculiarities and while keeping our roots in comparative law and in the comparative perspective of different legal orders. We are not just talking about international concepts um, <clears throat> that might appear, well, interesting as well, but we have constantly kept our, um, our view on domestic law on comparing domestic legal orders, thereby keeping this network rooted in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the basis basically of, uh, um, of, 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 of national law in an international, in a European perspective. And in my opinion, that is also a very fruitful um, endeavor. Um, comparative law, uh, becomes more and more important uh, in, uh, in, in the modern world. And since the international uh, perspective, the international law approach um, is showing some difficulties at the moment if we have a look at uh, international relations and international treaty making. Um, comparative law, however, gives us the opportunity to understand each other best, better and on, to work on this basis. And in my opinion, it is an extremely fruitful uh, 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 part of our, um, of our research. Um, then another experience concerns, obviously, um, the new technological facilities, um, which allow for new ways of cooperation and teaching. Um, while at the same time keeping up the ideal of an exchange in person, of traveling to different countries and of face-to-face -face teaching. Um, traveling has always been a means of acquiring knowledge and um, that is true even today, uh, even with our new modern technologies which make things much easier in certain respects, they will however never completely um, uh, replace uh, traveling and meeting in person and therefore you know, it's I'm looking forward I'm looking very much forward uh, to being able to 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 uh, come again to to meetings in person. Um, finally concerning the network, um, Professor Oppermann has already mentioned it. We have talked about it yesterday in more detail. The new branches that has have been added to the ELPIS network, notably the ELPIS research branch, while at the same time keeping up the traditional exchange of students and of professors as the core of our network. So we have something enriching the network. Um, which at the same time, however, doesn't change its core nature. Concerning the students, um, of course, we've got different experiences here in our group, but I think some experiences might be rather similar. Um, the student population uh, has considerably changed, in my opinion, and, and even before the pandemic has become much more diverse in their legal backgrounds and in their job plans, um, which is challenging, especially um, in the master program. Um, we have to deal with students that do not have a European background or even a Western background, um, but come from completely different legal orders in the world, which is thrilling, which is enriching, but which is in a way challenging because we have to meet their expectancies, we have to meet their, um, uh, their, their possibilities, their capacities uh, in, in, in our teaching. Then we've got the question of languages, which is, in my opinion, related to that issue, to this diversity. Um, of course, we are still following the ideal of learning and commanding several languages. Um, the European Commission's ideal is uh, two languages plus the one which is uh, your mother tongue. Um, 
however, we are dealing with students nowadays that have mother tongues um, from all over the world. And therefore it's not, basically it's not um, easy uh, sometimes um, to find a common ground if, for example, the classic languages of the network like English, like French, um, are not um, languages which the students easily command. And finally, um, let me just have a short look at a perspective of our network. We have, of course, a very solid ground in undergraduate and graduate uh, education. Um, however, we've been discussing now and again um, the paths possibly within the network concerning doctoral students um, related possibly to the ELPIS research branch. Um, so the network and its, um, its, its, its offer uh, to students uh, in the world um, is still developing, which in my opinion is a good thing because something which is developing is thriving, is living, is um, is, is going on. Um, finally, in, in this part, uh, a short, um, a short uh, look at uh, uh, the working environment in the universities, which has changed significantly, um, not only uh, owing to the Bologna process, uh, something which in my opinion, it was not an issue uh, when the network was founded, um, but which came later on and which gave us quite a lot of work to do. Um, an increasing amount of administrative tasks, including drafting regulations, including evaluation of programs and courses, um, an increasing workload for the students as well. Um, because things have become difficult. And even with the modern technologies, um, things have become more administratively challenging, in my opinion, um, making it more difficult for some students to go abroad, to find their courses, to um, study, uh, basically, to do the, uh, the, the, the the thing that they wish to do that is not filling out formulas, uh, but uh, filling out forms, but uh, study law. Um, and in this context, I would like to praise, and that is another experience, I would like to praise the functioning network as an invaluable incentive for exchange, because it's taking care of the students, the incoming students, the outgoing students, it is supporting them. And it is a, um, an extremely helpful uh, uh, partner in, in, in accommodating um, uh, our students. Let me finally um, have a short look at the question whether the ideas of the 1980s are still valid, because that's also part of the Alpes experience. Uh, are these ideas still valid? Well, Europe um, has changed significantly uh, since then. Uh, it was an entirely different shape uh, back in the 1980s with completely different challenges and concerning European community law as it then was. Um, the same applies uh, uh, to the substantive law issues. A completely different set of rules, a completely different character, much less integrated um, as it is now. Um, the same applies to the world, basically, and international legal relations. The world has been changing significantly, most significantly since the 1980s, as has international law and the ways in which international conflicts are being dealt with. Um, the 1990s, for example, the international law of the 1990s can by no means compared to the situation that we've got now. Um, therefore, it is imperative, in my opinion, to adapt for teaching and only the teaching methods, which we will discuss later in this conference, um, 
and which we have been discussing um, year after year in our conferences and meetings, but also the substantive topics we are teaching and which we are talking about. Um, we have to understand the development of the law. We have to understand comparative approaches and in my opinion, more now than ever. Um, we have to try by using those means to reduce complexity for the students by at the same time keeping depth and high standards of scholarship and transfer of knowledge. So it's not particularly helpful to um, teach the students <clears throat> the intricacies of an area of law um, which they can forget after that. And I allude to um, the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the, uh, words of Professor Oppermann um, that dogmatic structures perhaps are futile, uh, uh, can be forgotten easily. We have to make them understand what law is about, how law is developing, how law is, um, is, is uh, helping us to solve uh, conflicts. And of course, at the same time, we have to adapt uh, our law teaching to the requirements of the employment market the international employment market. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore, to sum up, um, it is obvious in my opinion that the long-standing ideas of Professor Feng of it, the, the founding of the ELPIS network remain valid. Um, we still have to foster and to deepen our international exchange and our mutual understanding. We have to develop best practices together. Um, we have to present students and researchers with a truly international perspective that can be beneficial both on the international level and on the domestic labor market. So all those ideas, even though we have seen many challenges, remain valid and remain important. And to conclude, let me quote, um, since I, well, I'm, I'm quoting the English tr translation, although I'm, I'm, I'm more than certain that he, Professor Fenge, would understand equally well the Latin original. Um, let me quote, um, on the work for our ELPIS network, um, a passage of Cicero's um, De Offici is on moral duties. Um, duty, um, he says, may be said to be either contingent or perfect. Um, we may, I think, it is still the quotation, we may, I think, give the name of perfect duty to the absolute right, which the Greeks term katortoma, uh, while contingent duty is what they call katekon. According to their definitions, what is right in itself is perfect duty. That for the doing of which a satisfactory reason can be given is a contingent duty. And in this category, is, in this category is, in my opinion, keeping up the Elpis network obviously is a perfect duty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my dear friend Friedrich. I think it was a very interesting speech that completed uh, the whole thing that we are doing here at the Elpis project. And now it's time for some discussion. I open the floor to the audience uh, and ask you if you want to say and uh, add something to what has been discussing in the topic about uh, uh, the Alpes evolution from its beginnings until today. May I have the floor? Turn? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Speaking about uh, digital technology, the most important thing I think is the disruptive character of this technology. Not the normal development, but only the disruptive. This means we have to keep an eye on this always because things are changing because of this, because of the 
increasing complexity because of the opacity and because of the vulnerability of the digital technology. This is something which, according to my opinion, we have always to have in mind. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, it, it, it's very well pointed out because uh, new technologies give us new opportunities. And one thing that we have done here, the office project, is to adapt to all the circumstances. Uh, we had the pandemic and we tried to do actions, conferences, a review online. We try to use all the methods, but there is always a kind of uncertainty that is that regards the, the use of internet. For instance, uh, uh, in my faculty uh, last month, there was a hacker that introduced in the computer of the whole the whole university, and for two weeks we had no co emails communication with us. And after the end, all the emails disappeared. Uh, so it was indeed uh, uh, something that we, nobody was expecting that now has uh, obliged us to find new tools in order to avoid this kind of attacks, but also show us that the things are ephemeris and uh, things only have uh, a duration that is not for the eternity. <laughs> so we have to deal with it. And that's something that you were pointing very well because uh, there is a certain uncertainty that is related with uh, the work of the internet and these, these tools that we as, as lawyers we are not specialists in using it. We always have problems that nobody else has. Well, my daughter always laughing about the problems I have and I need to, to ask her intervention because I could not solve them themselves. Even now that she's out of home in Berlin, I use my internet means to say, well, I have a problem with my computer. <laughs> Please help me. And she does it even in a long distance. So uh, we are not uh, uh, we are not able to have the best use of them. But nevertheless, we are flexible and we try to adapt. And that's something that we have done from the beginning in our network. We adapt to all the situations, mm -hmm. and uh, we keep doing the things as we used to, and we are trying to do new things. So I believe the key word is for one, for one hand, tradition, for the other hand, innovation. And we try to combine these two things the best way we can. But uh, I would like to hear more uh, uh, interventions in this discussion. Uh, Professor Vasco? Yeah. Uh, may I? Uh, yes, may, yes I, please, may, I you, may I give you an, uh, the perspective of an LP student because I was an LP student. Most okay. of you were professors at uh, the LPS network, but what I was uh, an LP student, and I don't know if everybody knows me. I started my legal education at the University of uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. And I saw uh, Professor Falzi is also participating in this conference. We can't see her uh, in the middle of my studies. She recommended me uh, to go to Hanover and take part in this Elpis network. It was in the year 1995, uh, uh, where I participated at the lecture of Europäische Rechtspraxis. And I met Professor Hilba Fenge and Professor Oppermann and uh, at their lecture, uh, I, the first time I heard about international law and uh, uh, Professor uh, Oppermann introduced me to the International Convention of uh, Sales of Goods, the UN um, Convention. And later on, I had the opportunity 
uh, to write my PhD at uh, Professor uh, Hilma Fenger. And uh, actually, I was also in Portugal with the Elpis network because I had the opportunity to participate in the Summer Academy. So this was also a, an opportunity uh, within the Elpis network. And later on, I also participated in an LLM program in Durham at the University of Durham, which was at that time was always, I don't, I don't know if uh, the University of Durham in Great Britain is still uh, in the Elpis network, but at that time, Rosa Greaves, uh, Rosa Greaves, the professor, was very activated. So I had the opportunity of this uh, comparative perspective of low teaching, and it was really a springboard for my career. So whenever I submitted my, uh, my uh, CV, um, I always asked about this Elpis network, what it was on and why I had this opportunity to study at uh, several universities around Europe. So I'm very grateful of uh, being uh, of having the opportunity to uh, being an LP student. Thank you very much. Uh, this is why we call this conference teaching and learning, because uh, what we are doing uh, is trying to combine both dimensions. And you are now that you are teaching, you are telling us the perspective of a student to the time you were a student. And, and that's very important for us to know that we are doing this job of combining those two perspectives. Thank you very much. And of course, it was always fun. It was fun, but uh, it was also, uh, yes, but uh, we have learned a lot of things, not only me, but all the other students in my, whom, uh, with whom I studied with. It was uh, a combination of fun and uh, learning a lot. Great. <laughs> it means that the thing works uh, because uh, teaching and learning is about people and about communication between professors and students. And that's the most important thing uh, at all. So now I give the floor to Andreas, my dear friend Schwarzer. There I met him in Hanover when he was uh, help, helping Professor Fenger in coordinating the Erasmus, the, the Elpis Network. My dear Andreas, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Vasco, my dear friend. Uh, I hope we will meet again uh, in Lisbon uh, next May. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> two times the intensive courses are going online, so I hope uh, I have the chance to uh, see you in person and also the students in person. Um, yeah. I'd like to point out something uh, on international networks. We have a lot of international co cooperation uh, between universities or faculties uh, in the international area. For instance, our university here in Innsbruck is part of the Aurora network. And of course, there are a lot of other networks um, and international cooperation um, is growing, which of course is a positive thing. But if we look to our Elpis network, um, every network has to find its own profile. Um, it seems that we are on a good way, uh, for instance, adding other areas to the exchange of students and, and teachers. But I think we have to st uh, still work on that. So we have to go on to find our own uh, profile, which is uh, different from other cooperations. Um, and the other thing is, of course, as we know uh, from our personal experiences, uh, all scientific cooperations, especially uh, cross-border or international are based on individual personal relations. And that is, I think, uh, a very uh, good experience here in our group that we all uh, are, yeah, let's say, friends uh, and we can discuss very openly. And uh, without this personal relationships, I think uh, no network uh, can function. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Indeed, the, the persons are the essential thing in our job. <laughs> uh, and uh, even we, when we use this kind of tools, uh, informatic tools, uh, we are talking to people that we met and that we know. And uh, the, the conversation by internet means does not replace uh, the meeting person to person, but it can complement it. And nowadays, with this pandemic crisis, uh, when we were not able to fly to Freiburg, uh, and apparently now we could, uh, because things change uh, really quick nowadays, uh, we are doing uh, this conference, uh, uh, but based on the person we met. And uh, of course, uh, to uh, meeting to travel is one of the bases of this of this group, and, and we experience it experience it in our lives. Uh, uh, talking about my experience, uh, when the times where there was no Erasmus program and these opportunities were not as big as they are, I prepared my uh, a PhD abroad. I uh, lived in Germany, in France, in Italy, in order to prepare the work I was doing. So, uh, and it was very important to do it. So, so the idea of traveling, of studying abroad, of doing comparative law, of trying to build a uh, comparative, an European perspective, a global perspective, is from the, the the point of view of the of the of the things that we are studying from the scientific point of view. It's really the biggest point and the, the most important thing that we are doing. But all that becomes uh, or comes from uh, a personal relation, and that's indeed very important. But I see that our friends in, in Freiburg uh, also want to add something. It's our friend Arne Kuneke that is coming. If, if I may, so and if uh, of course, of course. I'm, I'm seen, does it work? Yes. Yeah. So uh, this part of the, the conference is called the, the Eldest Experience. And uh, let me also add uh, one part, which is the, the core of my Eldest Experience. Because when we meet, we always talk about the, the Eldest family. And this is really something special about our network in the world of networks, our networks. And the, the familiar factor is something, the, the personal relations, if I can talk about my own experience, when about nearly 10 years ago, I was invited to um, present my Turkish university at that time to become a member of the Elvis family. And uh, the first impression was, oh my God, this, uh, professor who is the founder of the network is somebody I've seen before, but I, I couldn't really remember on which occasion I met and saw Professor Feng. And then after having made my presentation to become a member with my Turkish university in this Elvis network, it came into my mind. This was the professor who examined me in my first state exam when I was studying at Göttingen University and I had to go to Hanover to get this oral examination. And Professor Feng was the professor who was taking the exam in uh, civil law. So there was some connection already made, but the, the further steps were really very enriching for me because I had so many um, opportunities to, to get personal connections. And um, within the, the past years, I had many opportunities to meet some of the distinguished colleagues here of our family, not just um, when we met on the official um, daily or annual meetings, um, but especially um, cooperating by means of uh, teaching exchange or developing common programs, uh, common projects together. And this is really a very um, enriching um, experience for me. And I'm very grateful for the founder to have this idea to, to found this Elvis network, which became a family. And I'm also grateful for all the, the colleagues enriching this academic life um, with this personal factor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my dear Arndt. And indeed, uh, it's important, this connection. And uh, I believe that in, in the office, we have also another rule, is not to lose anyone. 
we try to keep everyone that has been connected with us in the past and we want and we want him to be connected with us in the future and by the way that's what happened with you at the time you were representative from a turkish university but we never wanted to lose you and after that you became individually a member of our Alpes community. So this idea of a contact with colleagues that become friends and uh, enrich our program and enriches our network. So uh, thank you very much. You are a living example of uh, a connection that you want to keep on, no matter if you have any institutional connection with us or not. You are a member of the Opus Network and of the Opus family. That's something that is interesting. And we've done that with most, with most of the people, with lots of people. Byrne was the former dean, a uh, former coordinator, but he still comes to our meetings. He is no longer the representative. He has no longer a task, but we want to have him here. Uh, Sylvia Brunet from... Uh, from Rouen keeps working with us and she's no longer the representative. We want to have these people that has connections with us and uh, we want to keep them part of the program. And now with newcomers, with the Americans and uh, uh, the, the colleagues from Brazil, from, from India, from Pune and all of them, we want to have them connected to our experience of the of Alpes. That's something that is really very important. I ask if there is any more intervention. Professor Fenger, you have the floor. Uh, excuse me, just, uh, just a short remark on my behalf. I realized that the name uh, in connection with my picture is Happy. This was done by one of my daughters who had a special conference with me, and they call me. Please, therefore, excuse me that the name is still. In here. But we love it, Hilmar. We love it. We love it. <laughs> it's accurate on this occasion. It's wonderful. Indeed, it is. <laughs> and that gives us this sense of family that we are talking before. <laughs> You yeah. are a kind of puppy, so of the group, so it's great. That's not the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you have. That. Okay, more interventions. Well, if not, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you want to have a break or we could step in the next panel. Uh, since everybody is already here uh, and uh, probably this will have a little bit more written than if you had a break. Uh, what do you say? You agree? If you agree, so now we are going to have the second panel, Modern War Teaching in Pandemic Times, the approach of Professor Fenger's pupils, and I give the floor to the moderator, that will be Professor Athanasius Kaisis. Uh, Professor Athanasius, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. I used to be a member of this illustrious group of LPs, but things happened which are not to mention here. After all, uh, I am not a member now, but I follow with great interest the works of this group and I think this is really a masterpiece. It's something wonderful, something which connects Europe and gives to the students an opportunity to learn more, not only the national law, but we have a good idea about what is happening in geopolitics and more important to see people from other European countries. Uh, allow me first, before we enter to the second part of this 
uh, program. First, to say some words about my, my teacher, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Tima Fenge. Uh, I met uh, Professor Fenge uh, towards the end of 1972. Maybe most of you were not born in that time, but this is true. It was the end of 1972. And I met Professor Fenge uh, in his office in Juristische Seminar. After all, he invited me uh, to his flat in January 1973. His lovely lady helped me to obtain my first room at the friend's house. This was really important. It was my first invitation by a professor, and it was the first time that a professor woman interested for me and find the way out for me to, to obtain my first room in Heidelberg, which was not so easy as you can fancy. Well, I closely uh, followed all lectures and seminars by Professor Fenge from 1973 till his maybe time of departure of Heidelberg, 1978-9. At least four years of uh, lectures and seminars uh, especially the seminars on legal theory, sociology of law, and legal methodology were extremely beneficial to me. Studying with Professor Fenge it, 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 it enlarged my horizon regarding the relationship between law and other uh, scientific disciplines. Uh, later, having all these premises, later I understood that we have entered into the age of digitality and added digital studies and law, this topic to my area of research. My professor Fenge did not only teach me civil procedure law and legal methodology. His uh, character always was uh, a model for me regarding the importance of free speech, of the openness and tolerance towards different opinions, the love for teaching, the care for students, and most importantly, civil courage, ethics, and research. I thank you, Hilmar, very much uh, for everything you have done for me in this difficult time, in this very difficult legal school of Heidelberg, as you know that personally. And I wish you all the best for the future. I am sure that you will work for students and that you, you will be continuing your scientific research for many, many years. All the best to you and to your family and many, many thanks one more time. Thank you very much. Uh, after this, First, I would like to, to give the speech to Professor Fenge. Maybe he would like to address some words. If it is not the case, we go on with the program. Uh, Professor Apalagaki will uh, speak about modern law teaching in pandemic times. Hilmar, would you like to, to have the floor? Hilmar. Professor Silva, would you ask Professor Hillman if he wants to have the floor for a minute or something? Yes, my dear Hilma, uh, our friend Athanasius is asking if you want to take the floor. 
No, thank you. Thank you very much, Tanasis, for your warm words. And we will meet at another place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I know my name, uh, Athanasius, is a difficult name. I always was asked in Germany, what's your name? I, I said, Athanasius Gaisis. The answer was, hello, Ambrosius, how are you? I said, not, it is not Ambrosius, it's Athanasius. And after this came, hello, Antonius, how are you? <laughs> this was <laughs> difficult, always. But this is the name, Athanasius. And, uh, not Athanasius, uh, which is a Latin name. In any case, uh, let's go on with uh, Professor Apalagaki. Karula, you have the floor now. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, dear chair, dear Thanasis, as German used to say. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues and friends for giving me the floor on such a special opportunity and occasion. Well, um, Professor uh, Caesis re uh, recalled also my memories. It was May 1984, as at that time, Mrs. Falci, the leader or the oldest professor in civil procedure law in the law faculty, called me to enter his office. That was the first time I met Professor Fenge. The reason was that having a big distance with Mr. Caesis, I was the one who at that time spoke acceptable German. So I have been asked to review the program, the bilateral agreement between Greece and uh, Hanover on exchanging students and staff, or oh, I say, and other unpleasant task. Short after that, 10 days after that, Professor Caesis, being my supervisor, ordered me more or less to join the Hanover faculty for my research. At that time, I was not very happy to join Northern Germany, but I didn't know that, that this, um, this event would change my life. Now, having completed almost 45 years in the Aristotelian University, of Thessaloniki, I'm really honored to be under the demanding but very constructive leadership and supervision of Professor Caesis in Greece and of Hilmar Fenge in Germany. Uh, I'm glad to be their people, although I know that I shall never reach the same achieve achievements like they both done. Both of, the, of them are registered as pioneers in the law teaching and of course in the insightful long lasting research, being mm -hmm. able to adjust their methods, their interests in the time. For instance, we all know that the honor professor Hilma Fenge still today with uh, his speech, show us the way how to survive in the program, how to reform it, how to keep this long lasting activity in Erasmus. And Professor Caesis is still an active member of the university community being for the time, uh, being currently the rector of the first international university in Greece, the International University of Thessaloniki. So I shall continue and I'm indeed very grateful to both of you to be uh, your uh, paper, even if you continue to be very uh, strict with me. What they have done, they have combined the methodology of law, the 
uh, traditional way of uh, thinking with new methods. Hilmar Fenge was the one who have introduced in his classes. I have had the opportunity to attend a lot of his uh, classes at that time, but also later on. And the same has been done by Professor Kaisis. And so by giving a, a small example of uh, their um, 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 logician methods, I can deliver to you some views and some experience regarding the law teaching in the pandemic. Maybe you are aware that the uh, Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki is the biggest in Greece, although Thessaloniki is the second uh, city in uh, population, amounts about 50,000 students in all the faculties and almost two and a half uh, um, uh, hundreds of uh, teaching staff. Uh, well, we can say that uh, at least the 50% of the students in all faculties uh, uses to attend the classes. The nature of the law teaching um, uh, is, um, is uh, law teaching uh, means that uh, uh, to, it's not mandatory for the students uh, to join their classes. Uh, nevertheless, the rooms are always full by students. A good reason, therefore, would be the fact that the people desire the socializing among them. The second should be that uh, our uh, teaching system is unfortunately um, still very examinations oriented. That means that the people have to be familiar with uh, the, the, the lectures uh, in the class and it seems that they do enjoy it. But gradually, at least 10 years before or even more, the university was imposed, let's to say, to introduce some um, e-meanings in order to cover a part of activities. So we have introduced the e-learning system where uh, we submit all the relevant material for this, the students or even the students uh, can submit their papers. We use, we use the same method in order to participate at committees which have to assess the teaching staff. And on uh, suddenly in March 2020, we had to introduce, due to the first pandemic lockdown, the remotely teaching as the sole possibility to continue our teaching activity. The beginning was almost a disaster, but after two or three months, Everybody was very happy and very familiar with it. We continue to use the same teaching methods even in the year, academic year 2021. Greece has, has had the second longest uh, lockdown at that time from November up to, to end of May 2021. And then being optimistic that the vaccination was in progress, that we have to come back to the normality in all life activities. Uh, we have now again as mandatory the physical teaching. Uh, the university reopened in September 2021 and following the opinion of the ministry of education, it is not legal to help classes via imminence. In the reality, we cannot challenge the ongoing pandemic. And therefore, to be honest, at least in the law faculty, we use either to go slow, solely remotely or 
to offer a hybrid system that means some hours and some classes in physical and some others uh, remotely. Uh, it is remarkable that the students themselves, they uh, seem to, to prefer uh, their remote system. And they prefer it because, uh, not only because they don't have to move, but because we succeeded to establish an interactive way of communication, which in the past and in the physical was not very common. For instance, we can share text, we can share uh, PowerPoints, we can exchange views. My experience is that at least 30 people open their cameras and 30 people participate actively uh, in uh, the classes. I have repeatedly asked the uh, students whether they would desire for us to help some uh, classes in physical presence. And just among 180 people who attend the classes, just three of them expressly told that they do prefer the physical. Of course, it is evident that for, uh, uh, for some reasons, which are not only uh, have to do with academic, but, but also uh, with the economy as a whole, we shall not replace uh, during the pandemic and after uh, it, the physical teaching by e-meanings. But we can keep a kind of roomies and zoomies, as the Americans used to say. We can keep a core of our activity in physical, and that's mandatory. And then we may make use and continue the e-meanings for having a supplementary communication with our students or to offer some additional classes. Unfortunately, we have three kinds of activity which cannot be replaced uh, through digital. The one is the research. You cannot do research without being physical presence in the library, in the room of the professor, without having a physical contact. Second, examination. The experience I have done through the uh, digital examination is a disaster. I, I could not, of course, prove that the students have used illegal methods to answer the questions, even if that's a multiple choice. But it is not coincident that at least 20% of them has received the best excellent grad, and that should, cannot be the case following the statistic. For these both areas, we need, as we say, a strong identification and that yet not be replaced remotely. Of course, Erasmus is a part of it. Erasmus is a transfer of experience. Erasmus is not only a teaching um, task. Erasmus is bringing mentalities, uh, legislation, people together, and it is not coincident that all of us um, said yesterday that we have lost the 50% of our capacity in Erasmus programs, although the University of Thessaloniki has a centralized system to proceed with bilateral or multilateral agreements. Erasmus cannot survive via e mini. On the other hand, uh, and thus in Greece, we live 
a digital revolution, the recent two or three years, everything is digitalized, e-payments, e-passports, e-vaccination, everything is digital. Recently, the law has also introduced the di digital private document where the people can proceed with a contract without being physical present. That is a part of it. But digital should remain the ultimum refugium for teaching, nevertheless, if that's medicine or law teaching. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Harula, for your excellent presentation. Before I open the floor for remarks and comments, maybe allow me just a question. According to my opinion, the most important thing is to see uh, which is the interest of the students. Which is the interest? Uh, is it important, so important to, to, to have, for example, person in person learning or is digital learning better for those people? All we have to find out is the best approach for the students, not so much for their colleagues, for the professors. We are there because the students are there. So we have to find out which is for those people the most efficient means of understanding, of learning, and of progress. This is the central question in my mind. By after this remark, I would like to open the floor, please. You have the floor now for remarks and of course questions and interventions and things like those. I think Professor Alexiu. <laughs> Anna, would you like to thank you? Yes. Anna is present. Hello, Anna. Nice <laughs> to see you. Nice. Uh, Teaching for more than 50 years, I, I have now the capacity to see the people who want to, to put a question at least <laughs> or a remark before they are uh, indicated in this way. So, Anna, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say hello, a big hello to Professor Fenge, whom I met 21 years ago in Thessaloniki when I was directing a program on legal education uh, in Greece. And he offered all his knowledge uh, to us, uh, especially during a conference that was organized at the end uh, of... You, you are in mute. You are in you mute, Anna. Anna, you are in mute. Unmute. You have to. Okay. Yeah. I have problems. I have problems with my. Yeah, computer. we all have. Don't worry. Um, we cooperated. I cooperated with uh, Professor Fenge. He did the honor to me to share his knowledge. And a book was finally produced in 2006 with the title LPs for Europe The European and Comparative Dimension of Law Teaching in Europe, which I guess, since there are no more copies, has become a best-selling book. I don't want to keep you much. I just want to say that I wish many years uh, of uh, happiness to Professor Fenge, uh, a happy, uh, Merry Christmas for the days to come and hope we meet even through this uh, electronic way again in the future. Thank you. So, social and emotional reasons, the most important thing for in-person teaching, this is a question. 
Professor Caisis, may I add something uh, yes, in order yes, also to, to deliver a small uh, answer uh, or a small proposal on your very reasonable questions? Well, uh, it depends from the circumstances. Um, we are, the Greeks uh, are aware that uh, due to a number of political and uh, social reasons, we have in Greece a huge number of universities, which are located even in small places. Well, they have some of them, even in the periphery, enjoy a, a high reputation, but uh, a part of them uh, is not uh, 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 is not really necess necessary. Well, if we see the education as a part of teaching, first of all, we have to minimize the number of existing universities in Greece. And then I fully join your view that we cannot replace physical, but we have to mitigate all the risks that we have due to this huge number of faculties. We are lucky to have just three law faculties in Greece, but we have at least 10 medicine uh, faculties, 20 mathematics faculties, I don't know how many agricultural faculties, etc., etc. First, we have to work on the quality and then to answer these questions. But of course, I fully um, agree we cannot replace teaching via e meanings. E meanings should have a secondary and a supplementary function and not the main one. Main one. Well, of course, if yeah. you allow me. Yes, please. Yes, Professor. First of all, let me greet uh, uh, Professor Alexiu, uh, uh, dear Anna. I remember perfectly being in Thessaloniki, and uh, it was a wonderful meeting. And uh, I participated also at the time in that experience of the book that we've done together. Uh, so it's a great pleasure seeing you again. Uh, second, uh, this thing about uh, the use of digital media, uh, I think, of course, as we have seen, as we are saying until now, it's impossible to replace the personal relation between a student and a professor, and that is a basis of our teaching experience. But at the same time, we should complement it with this kind of new media. The adaptation that we need to do is to use also uh, uh, side by side, uh, as we are doing a personal contact, we should also try this kind of means that offer us new possibilities of communicating and even of researching. And yesterday I talked about an experience that we tried for uh, the last two years, and we are repeating again now, uh, a cooperation with uh, the Alpes group, the Alpes network, and an American university, the Lincoln University. And the experience has been very successful. And the experience is that we should show uh, we, we should uh, uh, first choose some candidates in uh, Portugal and uh, in America and Hanover, no matter whatsoever we are talking about. And uh, these students are paired, uh, paired in groups, international groups of two students, one Portuguese, one American, one German, one American, and they have to do a task together. They help, in, in, uh, they help themselves in researching. They choose a topic, they research on that topic, and by the end, each of them writes a paper that is going to be presented in a course 
of his own university. And then to complement the old experience, the best uh, papers are chosen. Uh, last year, we choose the five best papers of each university. And we made a special emission by the internet where the students presented the papers and discussed the papers. And to finish all of that with a more traditional experience, we publish those papers, the best papers in our site. You can look at them if you uh, go to the Elpis webpage and uh, there is uh, a reference to this uh, Lincoln Elpis project, Lincoln Elpis Common Research. It was indeed a wonderful experience that uh, complemented the teaching that we could do in Lisbon and uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Duncan University uh, in, in Hanover whatsoever. And uh, it, it, uh, it was a wonderful way of putting the students from different countries working together and helping themselves. Because, well, if I have problems in finding bibliography for a topic on, the comparat in, on comparative law between Portugal and the United States, the, the pair, the student that is pair in the United States gives you, gives you that indication that you need. And uh, if you don't know uh, an expression that is typical of a legal system, you have someone to ask. And this kind of cooperation make, on one hand, good relationships, good, good friendships among the students. Some of them now are still writing each other and giving news and it make new personal connections. But at the same time, it was a nice uh, research experience and the works, you can see them published in the web page are of a good quality and sometimes even a very good quality. So this is a, a kind of things we can do, complementing the personal experience with these new technological methods that we should use in our teaching. And uh, if we look mainly at the post-graduation studies, if you look at the master courses, if you look at the PhD courses and these kind of things, this complement is even more necessary and more useful. So uh, I, I'm not saying that we should replace the person-to-person -person teaching, but I think we should complement it <coughs> by the use of technological means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Prodi Silva. Uh, Professor Karula, please, you have the floor. We can't hear you. Open your microphone. You are on mute. Karola, you have to. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Caesis. Uh, I heard uh, the speech of uh, Karula and also the, the, the comment and the presentation of Vasco. So I would uh, like only to complete with an experience uh, which we are doing at uh, Sergi CY, the new name, uh, quite now. Uh, we have uh, in, in, uh, in a subject, in my subject, it means history of law, uh, which is not, uh, not very usual <laughs> to, to work on, online. Uh, we have a cooperation with uh, five uh, colleagues from five uh, European universities in only in one uh, subject, uh, history of law. Uh, we have chosen one theme in this uh, uh, huge space of history of law, one theme, every university, uh, in every university, the colleague teaches his own students, uh, small groups uh, about this, and we have made uh, in uh, online uh, meetings, meetings with the professor, the colleagues from the other universities, and the students 
where the students can uh, present their work, their project to one another and collaborate. And we can also um, speak about that and uh, gu uh, guide uh, the, uh, the, the, the students and so on. And we will uh, meet each other once, and then we will um, prepare an online ex exhibition of uh, documents and uh, videos and so on. So it is a, a possibility that is uh, opened only because uh, we have this, pro uh, this uh, possibility of uh, online working of internet. And uh, we, are, we are under, we are used to, 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 to use it uh, because of the pandemic, I think more, but it is a, uh, quite a positive uh, experience and possibility. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I share the opinion that in the future, we will have a, a mixture uh, because first of the emotional and uh, social needs of the students. So we will have a part which will be in person teaching and learning. And of course, because of the great importance of the digital technology, we will have, and now we have already, partially teaching which will be digitally. This is my opinion, only personal, not uh, in my capacity as president of one of the biggest Greek universities now, but looking on those things, I have the, the feeling that we are going on to more and more digital technology. Uh, this is, for example, obvious in, uh, in the case of research. Now, we make research based on databases. Uh, databases is uh, something which all of us use and without this, it is important, it is impossible to be informed about the, the, the last publications and things like that. Of course, databases are expensive. And of course, databases are based on algorithms. And if we have to do with algorithms, we have automatically to think who made, who made this algorithm? Is the algorithm neutral, independent or not? Normally it is, yes, it is. But we have to have a look on this and to find out what is happening. Otherwise, uh, we have something which is prepared and we follow that and we go in the same direction, but plurality and more ideas and discussion and open society, especially open society and critic is, according to my opinion, very important for the science and especially for the research. Excuse me that uh, I have spoken too much maybe as uh, coordinator, but I would like to, to open the floor one more time. Maybe some of you would like to, to give his opinion or a comment or something like this. If it's not the case, I am obliged to- May I say something? Who, who, um, yes, please. I am from uh, the University of Groningen. I'm not a law teacher, but I am responsible for the incoming exchange students. And I always talk to them, uh, well, at this moment, of course, uh, online. Um, but the general experience is what you all described, that um, the digital version of teaching and the online um, things, developments now in these days, they give a lot of new opportunities, as, for example, Fasco described. But um, it is very, very important what, what you, uh, Professor Kashes, also um, emphasized. The social aspect for students is very, very important. It's not only law teaching, but also to make them grow into more complete um, 
European citizens accepting that there are many different views and many different way of law teaching. I once had a student, well, he was from the US and I always have a talk when students leave. And he said, this exchange was a mind opening experience. And that is a very important aspect, I think, of any teacher of any law teaching in the world. Um, together with the social aspects. The students need contact and need to feel uh, when they are in a group, what the others think and how, when they say something, what the reaction is of other students. I think that's a very, very important aspect of uh, being not a law teacher, but, but hearing the experiences of the students and, and uh, seeing their development when they first come to Groningen and then after a semester or a year when they leave Groningen again. They're really different persons. And that's, I think, is a, the most important aspect of, uh, of exchange uh, abroad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really important. We have all of us to see what the disruptive character of these modern digital technologies. What means that disruptive character? Something changes in another way and put away things which we know and we, which we are familiar. This is something which we have to have in mind. Of course, we have to have in mind this uh, increasing complexity of the system. The complexity is increasing every day. This is something, according to my pure opinion, really important. The third one, this opacity. Opacity means in this case, something is happening, but we don't know exactly what it is. We don't know that. Some of us think that they know, but if you want to have a deep idea of what is happening, we have to work really very hard with very modern instruments, with very, very modern literature, and of course, not only legal. This is the problem. And the worst of all, worst I say that like this, is this which I said, vulnerability of the system. This is well known to everybody as a cyber security. This is a part of the whole problematic. All those characteristics are to be taken under consideration. And of course, this is my personal opinion, we have to work with digital technology too. There is no other way. We have to do that, but very carefully in order to have the best results, the best effort our, for our students who, for which we are here and we work. Well, uh, I don't see any more Please, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tekin. Yes, please. Yes, I can. Um, I can um, say something about uh, our university. I'm working for the University of Public Administration of Lower Saxony, and our university was uh, recently funded uh, with one million uh, euros in order to develop a. Um, blended learning teaching concept and I think the future of teaching will be blended learning in terms of uh, pure transfer of, law, uh, of knowledge can be provided by self-study of the students and we should use the presence or the face-to-face -face teaching in order to exchange to discuss and maybe to practice law. This is, uh, this is how we see the, the future of uh, law teaching Yes, after the pandemic time. And uh, the, uh, this foundation is for three years and we have a, a research team who will um, develop now uh, this blended learning system. Thank you. This is important. Thank you very much for that. Well, I don't see any more comments. So according to the program, we have to go to the third panel. Thoughts about modern law teaching from 2002 onwards. Uh, Excuse me, Professor Jay. Please, there is please you should address and, and the moderation. Yes, thank you very much for that. 
No, no, excuse me, Professor Kaisis. They're still oh. missing one intervention from Andreas Schwarzer. Oh, that is you, still have you, you have to stay, You have to stay. We have another intervention. Okay, yes, please. Please, <laughs> Professor Schwarzer has the floor. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, once more, a warm Grüß Gott from Innsbruck in Austria. Um, uh, before I start, I just have uh, a technical question because uh, since some time I don't see the speaker in, uh, on my screen in, uh, with a big picture, I, I, I only see Professor Fenger, which is of course very nice. Uh, but I think maybe it's, it would be nice to see the speaker on on the main screen. Is it possible or is there something wrong? I don't know. I'm seeing everybody in my computer, but um, I can ask uh, the technician that is helping us uh, if you allow me. But we can go on. Yes, of course, I will. So, uh, because we are not out of time, but of course, time is running out a little bit. Um, thank you for inviting me to give a short intervention in this conference to pay homage to my academic teacher and mentor, Professor Hilmar Fenger, on occasion of his 90th birthday, which has been some weeks ago, and of course, to value him very highly. This is a big honor for me, and I will do this with real pleasure. Of course, it would be more fun to see you all in person in Fribourg. Uh, and we have heard about fun in science from Bernd Oppermann, but this is the best way to do it uh, over online. So at the beginning, some history after the completion of my doctorate Hilma Fenge at that time holding the chair for civil law and civil procedure at the University of Hannover, offered me a job as an academic assistant to give me the opportunity for working on my habilitation. That happened now 30 years ago in 1991. And I was of course very happy to get this chance and he supported and promoted me as we closely work together also in building up the ALPS program for the next six years until I got my postdoctoral qualification and I had to go on with my academic career by teaching at other faculties. But we stay in contact and I would say we become friends. Uh, so my task today is to give an impression of the transfer of knowledge in legal education which Hilma has mentioned in his speech at the beginning, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Just to inform you about the situation at my faculty, very shortly after the breakout of COVID in a famous skiing destination situated nearby Innsbruck in the Tyrolean mountains, the University of Innsbruck abruptly shifted all courses of every faculty to distance learning on March the 10th, 2020, because our lecture period had just started on March the 2nd in 2020. And then during the next period of 19 months until the end of September this year, that is for three semesters, there were only rare exceptions allowed for courses, mainly with low numbers of participants mainly regarding practical education and when personal exchange between teachers and students is absolutely necessary. So all the other courses has to be online. With the start of this winter semester at the beginning of October, we optimistically return to the classrooms, even if only with a reduced utilized capacity. But now after we have suffered dramatically rising infection rates in Austria, we are back to online courses since three weeks. So 
maybe this is uh, a never ending story. I don't hope that, but it seems to be. Of course, teachers as well as students, not only in Innsbruck or Austria or even Europe, but worldwide have mostly necessarily adapted to a variety of distance learning instruments and methods. But I like to raise the question if this should be basically the way of modern law teaching, like the headline is saying. So I think we have to differentiate between traditional types of teaching and the way they are taught during the pandemic. To analyze the effects of distance teaching and remote learning under COVID conditions, uh, it is necessary to differentiate between the various types of courses taught at universities. So there are three main categories which are used since decades in humanities and social science, including law, which are lectures, tutorials, and seminars. They serve different purposes and therefore they have to be treated differently. So first, for the lectures, stemming from the beginning of university education in the Middle Ages, lecture is still the classical and conventional form of teaching in higher education institutions. The German description as Vorlesung or reading points to this early days when there were no, no or only a few books available, which was why the lecturer has to read to the students his manuscript or out of a book, sometimes commenting it. We heard from Hilma at the beginning of our seminar uh, that this was even the case when he studied in Heidelberg in the 1950s. Uh, nowadays, and for a long time, this seems to be not necessary anymore because we are flooded with a massive abundance of literature since many years, even always available over the internet. But still we have lectures at universities. Now enabling the academic teacher to find his own way and style, how to get the relevant information to the listeners. At best, professors are teaching in the same areas in which they do research. Following William von Humboldt's ideal of model of combining research and studies from the early 19th century. Then the students are up to date in their legal science. So lectures are an instrument to transfer a lot of knowledge or learning, learning material in a limited time to the audience, especially in big classes, which are common in today's crowded mass universities. This leads to frontal or ex cathedra teaching, leaving little room for interaction between the teacher and his students. By the way, this problem could be solved if classes are split up into groups of 25 or 30 participants, like for instance, in US law schools or under the German pilot project of a single stage legal education in the 1970s, then in the newly founded law faculty in Hanover. Is this traditional form of teaching through lectures enhanced or even not downgraded if conducted from a distance? I don't think so. First, pure online lecturing in big classes, mostly without even having the students on the screen, is much more exhausting for lecturers and for students than being in a classroom. Something which brain scientists are referring to as video fatigue. And most surveys show that teachers are a lot more stressed and annoyed when conducting distant teaching. And this is my personal impression too. I am feeling really tired after a Zoom teaching session, only looking into a black hole. So this is counterproductive because if the lecturer is in a good mood and feels comfortable and has fun, his lecture, of course, is more convincing and stimulating. 
and in-person lectures are not only a one-way delivery of information. The teacher observes the students in the room, he gets an impression of the comprehension, and he is able to adjust the style and the content of lecture in real time. This is not possible with big classes in pure distant learning settings. Remote students too are more stressed than in the classroom. And that of course reduces their learning results. In face-to-face -face situations, often there are questions, even in bigger classes, yeah, from my experience, so that other students benefit from watching their classmates and are more willing to engage in the lectures themselves. This can only happen in a very reduced way online if the participants are not visible cannot use their microphone or only communicate per chat, which is normal in bigger classes from 50 people, participants onwards. Second, uh, the idea of hybrid lectures that are classroom lectures, which are also transmitted to remote students. They combine a face-to-face -face event with an online lecture in the same time. This, I think, is even more problematic because it creates two classes of students with different possibilities to benefit from the lecture. Those who can watch only the transmission are in the same or even worse situation as participating in an online course. The others, of course, are better off. Another third option, but in addition to a live online or hybrid lecture, are recorded lectures. Then of course, students are more flexible and they could decide at what time they watch the lecture. But I think this format is even more reduced regarding communication and more one way or frontal. Overall, there is no room for any interaction. Moreover, playing a recorded lecture creates the intent incentive to skip parts that seems to be uninteresting because the students are not dedicating a certain time slot for the lecture. There is no commitment to be in the lecture. And finally, if they watch while keeping busy with other activities, such as driving or cooking or doing sports, they are distracted and much less focused <coughs> than the classroom would. So this is for lectures and I think online is only, let's say third or fourth best. And tutorials, these classes are usually run in smaller groups, mainly between 15 and 25 students and are intended to foster group discussions often on the content of lectures. They are used to train students. That is why they are named Übungen in German by working on exercises. It is shown how to apply legal rules in practical situations, such as finding a solution for a problem of a certain case. Because interaction and communication is more relevant in tutorials than in lectures, the adverse effects of online teaching are much stronger. This is only scarcely compensated by the possibility due to a much lower number of participants to make the students more visible via camera or to let them use the microphone. Especially practical training is hardly effective if conducted in a distance. And last not least, seminars. The seminar is a course at the university where the students are presenting a scientific paper on a certain topic instructed by a lecturer to research more in depth a legal problem. Like in tutorials, the number of participants is limited mostly to 15 or 20 students. In this type of course, the students are in the situation of a lecturer because they are informing and thus teaching their fellow students. That means due to their active role, they are much more stressed that if they are passively following a lecture, because online sessions are increasing these negative effects, they are detrimental to the learning outcome of seminars. 
So an outlook, from my point of view, distance teaching, teaching cannot adequately replace face-to-face -face courses. That of course was made clear even in the discussion before. Uh, apart from the arguments presented above, remote learning, learning is also creating deficits in social life and in social learning or learning in the social surrounding. In this pandemic type, it's helped us to offer courses with a reduced level of efficiency and learning results. But I would advise against a massive conversion to online courses in the future. We don't should transform to distance learning universities like Ten Universität Hagen or Open University in the Netherlands or in Austria, the university in Linz. Of course, that doesn't mean to abstain totally from any teaching out of the physical classroom. As we heard in the discussion for certain purposes and in addition to teaching life in a broad and fundamental way, different concepts of learning in the digital sphere could be created, tested and used. And I am sure that Hilma Fenger on the basis of his commitment in legal education will observe how things develop in this area during the next years. And I like to conclude uh, with uh, a citation uh, in my area. It's from a singer songwriter and also a Nobel Prize winner. So then you know that this is Robert Zimmerman or also known as Bob Dylan and is from his song from the 1970s, uh, which is called Forever Young. And I cite the first verse, may God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. Thank you, Hilma. If you allow me just for a technical reason, I found the technician and it says that he's broadcasting with all the participants seen at the same time. Probably it's your computer because there is a, a button in the top of the, of the program on your right hand that says visualization. And you should click on that, on that top. And then you have the option of seeing just the one that is speaking or every participants or having the whole picture. So you should choose. It's a problem of your computer, not of the mission. I'm sorry. Okay, yes, thank you. I, wonder, Great. I only want to mention that, okay. Okay, but you can solve it by uh, clicking in the bottom visualization and, uh, and you can see us all at the same time. We have one more comment, Professor Apalagaki, you have the floor, please. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, it's true that uh, the debate, well, can be even longer. Uh, well, I have just one remark. Uh, I'm aware of uh, the concerns, mainly in Germany, about the uh, E-classes. And uh, it was extremely uh, interesting, the categorization of uh, Professor Schwarze. Well, uh, the remark is that we have experienced uh, the um, E-classes under extraordinary circumstances under the pandemic, I mean. Uh, we have not uh, run such a method in normal times. So far, uh, I have some concerns if we ca can come to final conclusions on this question. While well, during the pandemic, e classes was the sole partner alternative of doing nothing. We had none other possibility than to keep at least 
30 or 40 or a part of our teaching activity under pandemic and under lockdowns. Whether it's appropriate uh, to design the future on this topic, having done um, an experience under these extraordinary circumstances is a question for me. A another remark, more or less, all the European countries, uh, they spend public funds in order to uh, keep their universities in full operation with some exceptions, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and then we are missing funds in research, in other activities, or even in infrastructure. I'm wondering whether it's appropriate to open a discussion how we can save funds or we can flow funds in other most relevant um, activities instead of keeping very expensive infrastructures in buildings, electricity, and others. Well, uh, we have to, to take into account all these factors which determining how uh, the, uh, on the, the quality of education and the substance of education itself. For me, in person, it's very early to, to come to any conclusions, and that's why I just uh, have delivered the picture in the pandemic time. But uh, of course, we are looking in the future, we cannot uh, come to, to, to a fixed conclusion uh, that uh, uh, e-classes have to replace physical or physical should continue to dominate the education because it, it's too early uh, to, to, to come to a conclusion like this. The voices against or in favor uh, shall increase in the future and uh, of course, uh, except uh, some fields where we need socializing, I don't see why to exclude in total uh, the remote teaching. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a, an old, very old, but according to my opinion today, strong argument. If you have a new technology, you use it or you are obliged to use it. You cannot go out of this modern technological society. This is something which I believe. That's why I am the opinion that we will have in the future a mixture of both systems. Uh, principally because of the emotional reasons and social reasons. This will be the part of in-person teaching and the other one will be... Iveta? No, thank you. Okay. Mute. 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 So please, you should do... This is Norman Sean in uh, Azo. Okay. This is my opinion, and the question is to be answered. Uh, so I would say, are we an old school? Are we an old school, or are we a modern school? This is a question. This is something which we have to answer. And Professor Kaisi, if I may, I, I just missed to, to do, give another info to the participants that starting from 2001, and you are very well aware of it, uh, we have the possibility to help even procedures, civil procedures, of course, not penal one, uh, via imagings. And uh, in the last time, uh, in the framework of digitalization in Greece, uh, some courts have started to make use 
of these uh, chances. And so they have reduced the cost and they have increased their productivity. That's why I said that we have to consider a lot of factors uh, in order to come to a, a reasonable conclusion. Well, okay. Uh, as I said at the beginning, those technologies, digital, which we have in the courts, this is only the development of the old, of the old technology. It's nothing more than that. You have the facts now. You have digital facts. You have modern uh, forms of the old system. And the question there is, if this technology is disruptive or not. This is the question. If the question is disruptive you make something new, a new society, new new situation, new students, new teachers. This is something which we never have to forget. Allow me to say that. Uh, just as a personal, as I said, opinion, only a personal opinion. But disruption is something which is in our days very common and we have to, to look at this. Well, I see that uh, we can finish this session. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Caisis, for your brilliant conduction of the discussion and all the participants for the brilliant way as they presented the questions. And I think the next panel, where we are talking about the future, is the best in order to study more the technological perspective. Because we cannot take the computer out of this question. It's really impossible. We are living with computerized things. Uh, even the clockwork now is the digital. Uh, we are using the mobile every hour. We can't live without emails. And we can't live without these technological methods. So the idea of coming back to a classroom where there is no computer, there is no use of technological means, I think it's an idea of the past. So we should try to combine the best of both worlds, the best of the old world and the best of the new world. But in order to do so, we should also hear the, uh, um, the ethno generation. Uh, we must uh, see, uh, and talk about the future. And I think that's what's going to happen now in the panel that is going to be uh, moderated by Professor Rui Guerra da Fonseca uh, from my faculty, one of the, the youngest and the brightest among the youngest uh, colleagues that we have in Lisbon. And we have the pleasure of having two other youngsters in our, in our, uh, in our help, is even if we know them for a long time, Professor Anne Kunica, that is always chasing the less technological idea, the less technological measure to introduce it in the, their own classes. And Dimitrius, Dr. Dimitrius Parashu from Hanova, that uh, is also very interesting in these teams. So I believe it will be a, a good panel in order to finish our conversation of today. And I give immediate the floor to Professor Rui Guerra de Fonseca. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor, for giving me the floor. Uh, it's uh, the greatest honor to be here uh, chairing this uh, session in an homage to Professor Fenge. Um, my first words uh, are for him. Uh, is not present at the moment, but uh, uh, my first words are for Professor Fenge. Uh, I am, a, I believe, a third or even fourth generation uh, help is member. Uh, and this means that I only met Professor Fenge once, and this was uh, in person, of course, and this was in uh, our uh, last meeting in person in Hanover. Anyway, I would like to 
thank Professor Fenge for the, the creation of Elpis, which of course allows us today to be here and allows me particularly to be present in this forum and make uh, and have having made already such good friends uh, as the ones that are going to speak after me, uh, particularly Arndt and Dimitrius uh, Parashu. So uh, many of the um, uh, many of the things that I wanted to highlight in this brief uh, first intervention of mine, because I am uh, substituting Paco Balaguer and I cannot match him, of course. So this is just a uh, this is just a brief introduction to prepare the floor to uh, to Arndt and to Dimitrius. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, many of the things I wanted to uh, to highlight today have links with the previous uh, interventions, uh, namely the, the, the initial intervention by Professor Fenge uh, and also uh, Friedrich Germann's intervention after that. And uh, interestingly, also the last remarks uh, by uh, Professor Caisis. Um, I already wrote uh, a text uh, on uh, distance learning and video-based academic contributions for, uh, for the last book we had on this coordinated by, by Friedrich Hermann. Uh, so I do not intend to go back to that. Uh, I am a bit uh, uh, skeptical uh, on, uh, on, on many of these possibilities. But I believe that as Professor Caesis, I, I think was stressing, technology came to stay. Uh, and uh, it, is, um, it is impossible for us uh, from now on to ignore uh, what, uh, what is going on. Like Professor Vashku said, we must uh, pay attention to the youngest generation uh, to the to the means that they want to use, and of course, uh, the uh, video based learning or distance learning or e classes um, came about in this uh, very specific context of COVID. Uh, but I think they came to stay. Uh, I, I'm saying this because. Uh, uh, E-classes came in the context of necessity, of needs. Well, after this need, another will come. Uh, because uh, like uh, Michael Oakeshott used to say, uh, there is uh, something called the sovereignty of the felt needs. So uh, after COVID, it will be something else, uh, either uh, energy problems regarding traveling, or uh, even uh, traveling costs. I know uh, in, in our university, uh, we have master thesis and even PhD thesis being discussed uh, on the Zoom platform because um, not only because of COVID anymore, but also because it is very costly for people to travel. Uh, and so this is another felt need that is coming about. Uh, and so uh, I don't know in, uh, in what uh, particular framework, but I believe that, uh, that these, these ways uh, came to stay. Of course, we cannot, we should not eliminate personal uh, contact. This is, uh, this is something not... Uh, uh, this is simply not, uh, not thinkable. Hmm? Uh, and even if we uh, turn our attention to the Erasmus program, Erasmus was always uh, such a big hit uh, because of personal contact, because of the learning, uh, of the general learning, not only law, uh, but human learning that it... Uh, enhances uh, and if uh, well if, if one of the biggest 
conquests in Europe were the Erasmus babies, that, that would simply not be possible if everything would be done uh, on a distant basis. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think that um, uh, it is possible that we are, uh, we as law professors are on a verge of a, uh, of a creative uh, destruction, uh, meaning that uh, uh, our traditional instruments uh, and our traditional uh, positioning towards teaching is inevitably changing. Uh, we might not be certain of how much and how it is changing, but it is. And technology is, of course, uh, in the central debate of, uh, of this. Uh, because uh, new technological means, and when I speak about technology, I'm thinking not only about distance learning, of course, but databases, as was mentioned before, algorithms, audiobooks. Uh, audiobooks are, uh, are a major change in the way we work because we are used, we were used to write and still are extensively. And audiobooks are changing the game, as in a certain way, our LPSV law review is also changing the game. So, uh, our way of working and our way to approach students is uh, changing, I would not say radically as of yet, but uh, it is changing uh, rapidly and intensely. Uh, these, these new technological means provide students with something that we cannot um, actually compete with. Uh, it is information. We cannot super, we as human beings cannot supersede technological means giving information to students. Uh, let's just uh, take one example. Um, uh, uh, collections of legislation that we use to organize uh, are much more useful for, for students, not in paper but in, in digital formats because they are searchable they are usable in other ways and they are portable <laughs> much more portable than books of course and this is uh, this is also true for us meaning that um uh, the, the the information that technology provides combines itself with a certain kind of knowledge that uh, I'm pr pretty sure we cannot compete with. So uh, in order to avoid our creative destruction uh, and also uh, uh, enhance our role as, uh, uh, as law professors, I think we should concentrate more on wisdom and less on knowledge, meaning that um, uh, it, it is more important for, uh, for the future, it is more important to provoke the students with complex questions uh, in order to um, claim from them complex uh, thinking to test uh, if simple answers actually make sense. Because uh, we cannot, um, we must preserve ourselves to things that only human beings can do. And these things only human beings can do. Uh, placing complex questions and demanding complex reasoning in order to test the simplicity of answers, this is something that only uh, human beings can do. Um, can this be done uh, online with e-classes? Well, uh, some of it, uh, yes, uh, some of it cannot, uh, I believe, because uh, distance learning only works uh, or distance meeting like we are having here today only works, I think, if you have a pre-interest 
uh, that allows you to focus on what is happening. Uh, because uh, if, uh, if that's not the case, then it's almost impossible to create interest, interest online. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very, very difficult to, um, uh, to create interest online, uh, unless it is uh, an interior uh, and psychological process, like when you are watching a movie. Uh, but this is not the case. This is not a movie. These are lectures and conferences so you must be, uh, students must be pre-willing to be focused, otherwise it will not work. Uh, and for this to happen, uh, I think that uh, it must be promoted personally before uh, using, uh, before using online uh, technology. Uh, and so uh, this is, I think is uh, one of the greatest challenges that we are going to face uh, in the future, which is how to, how to leave technology for knowledge and preserve ourselves for uh, wisdom, uh, preserving ourselves to promote uh, complex reasoning that machines and algorithms will not be able to substitute. Uh, I don't mean complicated reasoning, because of course an algorithm can be very complicated. I mean complex reasoning with judgment. This is uh, what we must <laughs> students for. Uh, less professional training and more uh, philosophical or, or uh, legal philosophical training to put questions forward and to train to give uh, simple answers through uh, complex reasoning. So this was just a, 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 this was just a start. Uh, I believe I even spoke more than I should, and so uh, I will immediately give the floor to um, to Arndt uh, Kuneke, to my good colleague and friend Arndt Kuneke. It is a pleasure to see you uh, online, of course, but we have a pre-interest uh, in listening to you. So we are pretty much focused on what you are going to say. You have the floor. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Rui. And uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, great honor to speak uh, at the occasion. Homage to Professor Fenger. And the way you introduced, you said it's about creating interest. And so uh, it's some pressure on me because uh, I'm trying to create interest for the audience now and to present you some of my thoughts about how modern teaching could uh, be practiced in the future. And um, for that, I would like to, to share the screen because I um, prepared some uh, presentation, um, which should underline how... Um, yeah, my, my thoughts, no, put it the other way, this uh, presentation should also try to visualize uh, my thoughts about modern teaching from 2022 onwards. Don't be irritated because here at the Fribourg University, the screen is down on me, so I need to, to take a look down. So um, I'm not losing um, my connection with you, hopefully, but my main idea is uh, sharing the uh, screen and presenting you my thoughts. Uh, first of all, once again, thanks a lot for um, making me part of this uh, panel because uh, it's really an honor to be among these distinguished colleagues. And uh, it's an honor to give a short homage to Professor Fenge, who with his idea of founding this Elpis network in the eighties was kind of ahead of his time. And uh, he serves as a role model with his innovative ideas. And now I don't have the aspiration myself to present something being ahead of my time, but at least let me try to share some of my thoughts about modern law teaching in the future. So I would like to start with the presentation now. And hang on a second, how does it work? I need to click on here. Technical problems, that's always the first thing happening. Yes, like this. Um, challenges of the, of the future teaching. 
is first of all, how did we start? It started the old way of teaching like Professor Seng and also some others already mentioned. We delivered some content shaped for just the universal consumption in the form of the traditional lectures. But that's the old way and we need to be modern. University needs to keep pace with modern life, with the modern student life. That's why we face some challenge. We need to keep pace with a new way. We need to try to be modern and um, the role of the instructor changed. The expectations widened and also our area of responsibility is extended. We are not only a lecturer anymore. We also need to coach the students. We need to give them some guidance. We need to support them and communicate with the students as they navigate through um, content and data, which is enormous at the time. You already mentioned how much sources are available in the internet. So we need to give the students some guidance because otherwise they will be lost in these thousands and millions of informations. So the difference between the old way of teaching and the new form, the new way is that we need to truly valuing how the students think and what they really need. So the teacher's task is we somehow need to get into the minds of the students to figure out what they value, how they think, what they need. And for that, I think the approach for the future, which was already mentioned at several uh, speeches here before, is kind of establishing modern hybrid form of teaching, hybrid environment for teaching so that we, the teachers, do not only appear like I'm appearing here just in front of Gerhard at Fribourg University in presence, but that I also appear online for the other participants of our panel here at the conference in the homage of Professor Fenger. So the modern hybrid teaching for me is based on three different pillars. The first thing, how we should start with the concept of modern hybrid teaching is we already need to appear in the student's individual sphere of learning. Not just in the classrooms, but we already need to take the students appear at home in the individual learning sphere in person somehow. And that means before each class, the students need to receive certain tasks for self-directed learning. And there are different means of tasks, different sorts of tasks we could deliver them. For example, like it's more or less the old fashioned way, give them some reading material from textbooks, but of course delivered online that it's always and everywhere accessible for the students. Or we could give them links to some other online sources or a bit more personal approach, which I usually prefer is to give them some instructor provided videos or podcasts where you in person as the professor personally address your students so that you not just use material which was produced by somebody else, but that the students always have the connection. Hey, this is my teacher giving me the first instruction while I'm at home preparing me for the classroom. Classroom is the second part of this modern hybrid teaching as I have it in mind. It's the in-class time. And of course, ideally, it should be in a physical classroom where we all meet face to face. But of course, in times of the pandemic, we need to replace it somehow. And therefore, um, it could also be a virtual classroom. So how does it start? The inside the classroom, the in-class time. I guess we should start having delivered some general content already pre-class to collect and find a solid basis for the students. So we need to check if they really understood the material we submitted them online in advance. So therefore, it's the so-called readiness assurance process to check if the students are prepared for the class. So take about 20% of your in-class time to check that the students understood the concepts, um, the terms, and the explanations you delivered pre-class. The main part of the in-class time should be dedicated to team application exercises. It's not doing an old fashioned lecture. It's let the students work with 
the knowledge with the material you submitted already pre-class. And this should be the biggest part, about 80% of the whole in-class time. And according to my experience, a good way would be to divide the big class into smaller groups to enable the students to discuss certain problems or cases within their formed teams. So it means they working on the basic knowledge or on the basis of the knowledge they already received pre-class and which was discussed again in this readiness assurance process and then they work with it. So you as the teacher take the role as a moderator giving guidance when the students sit in the classroom, discuss certain topics among each other. For example, in law classes, an ideal way would be giving them a case, dealing with the problems you presented already in the pre-class time. The teams discuss the, the problems, they discuss the cases within their own teams, and then they should present it inside the classroom so that the inner team discussions become an inter-team class debate and discussion being guided, moderated by you as the modern teacher. But the in-class time is not the last part of the modern hybrid teaching. It goes on because the students go home and they keep on thinking about what they did in class. Therefore, they also need assistance and guidance after class. So the after class time is the third pillar of the hybrid teaching. So it's meant to be used for reinforcing the learning after class by, for example, clarifying the class discussion. If there are still some upcoming questions, you as the teacher are supposed to give answers. So on what communication platform ever, I personally like this personal approach, having some WhatsApp group for each of my courses so that the students can always ask some questions within the classroom and also personal to me so that I can answer what's coming up as some questions after the class. You could also upload some quizzes where the students individually could check their knowledge if they really understood the core of the class. And this is the innovative part of my presentation now because Bashko is uh, typical in giving some challenges and when he was asking me, so think about some innovative concepts, how teaching could be in future, I needed to become creative. And this is what I call the 24-7 e-lecture assistance. I will show you and explain you how it works. For that, first of all, I need to do something for my voice. For this, what I call e-lecture, um, you need modern tools. And what you see here, apart from the mobile phone, the smartphone here, on the right-hand side, it's kind of the Amazon family. This echo dots, these echo shows, whatever, which is quite common now in the modern world, having these devices at home, communicating with this lady called Alexa. But using that idea for university, it's not Alexa, it's called e-lecture. And it's kind of a branded, blended learning because here in my case, each student would be supplied with any of these devices according to their choice. And you see there's a branding on it from the university or from the lecture here in my case. So these tools should be used to give the students this 24 seven e-lecture access to your class being delivered, not just online, but also via audio, via video on these shows. For example, you appear on the screens of these dots, you appear as a teacher on the screens of the mobile phones. And of course also, like in a video on the screens of the students. So this is the way how you could easily address the students individual learning sphere, giving them 24 seven assistance without being available 24 seven. Because you prepared everything via videos for the tools, for example, you could use with the monitors. You are available on the communication platform, social media, for example, WhatsApp, or like we do it right now, give them the chance to meet with you at least once in a week, visually in a virtual classroom to have kind of classroom atmosphere. This is what I called the e-lecture approach. 
And let me show you how it will work in reality. Of course, just some innovative utopia, but I guess it could be realized if there's anybody who is going for it. So a student would open the application which is needed on the mobile phone, in my case about European Union law. It's my e-lecture. Either you address it on the mobile phone or you ask this little advice, please e-lecture, open something for me. Here, it's an interactive course being delivered by me as their professor. So either you can appear there as an icon or as in present, whatever you prefer. And the students could use it as they use this Amazon Echo uh, tools. This would be the first screen to access. And here you see the professor is appearing on the screen of the students and the students could ask you anything. And there are three means of assistance being provided, either here with a video, with a document or with an audio file. So the students can easily choose how they prefer you as a teacher explaining certain topics. And here in my example, it would work like this. The student would ask, e-lecture, please explain the difference between a regulation and a directive in EU law. And then the answer would come. The professor appears and you as a student would hear the voice of your professor because that's pre-recorded all kinds of questions. And the answer would be a regulation is defined in article 200 88 Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union as measure which has general application shall be binding in its entirety and directly applicable in the member states. In contrast to that, a directive is binding for each addressed member state only to the result to be achieved, but leaves the choice of form and methods to the national authorities. So then, that's the answer to the question the student used this e-lecture application for. But maybe the student is not satisfied with the answer. Therefore, on the next page of the app, the following signs appear. The professor is there again, and you as a student could opt for repeating the things which were said to get some more information or to ask some further questions. This is the idea I have about how future teaching in the years 22 onwards might work. Of course, I know it's a lot of work to provide all possible information within this application for the students as video files, as audio, and supplement it with the necessary documents. But I guess if some person, some professors would take this challenge and try to really feed this app with sufficient information. It would be an amazing tool for each student to use anytime, anywhere, and as much as they like. So far about my thoughts, how modern teaching might look like from 2022 onwards. And thank you for listening. And I'm curious about your ideas and comments. Arndt, thank you very much for your colorful uh, proposal uh, and for your uh, intervention. Uh, I believe that uh, it's better that we move immediately to uh, Dimitrius' intervention and at the end join questions and uh, remarks for both of you. So thank you again for this, uh, for this very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I would not like to give the floor to Dimitrius uh, before we could stop the screen sharing because I don't know if he's going to use it as well. I, I wouldn't need it, but it's okay. Thank you. You wouldn't need it. Well, uh, okay. So uh, if, you, if you won't need it, it's probably better that we move along, wouldn't you say? Gladly, gladly. Thank okay. you very much, dear Louis. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to um, express uh, my special honor and pleasure to talk in this uh, occasion uh, within the framework of the homage to our dear Professor 
Fenge. And uh, I'm also very happy to participate in this um, panel among friends, dear friends like uh, Rui and uh, Arndt. Uh, I have to admit, dear Arndt, it is uh, never easy to fill your shoes. <laughs> and it is especially difficult to talk after your presentations, <laughs> but I will try to do my very best. Um, so, dear ladies and gentlemen, some months before in the supermarket, because I tend to go to the supermarket either very early in the day or very late due to the pandemic, that is a habit now that I am uh, going to the supermarket at these times. Um, I was just checking out some uh, uh, something I had to buy and uh, a person approached me and uh, was it, are you Mr. Parascu? And uh, I was like, um, how could you recognize me? Because I was with, with my mask, like a, well, like a pirate, <laughs> of course, not well recognizable. And of course, I'm not wearing uh, the, the things I usually wear because usually <laughs> students know me by, by wearing ties and I don't know, a jacket and uh, well, cufflinks and stuff. So, and I was in, in my jeans and a pullover and with my mask. And uh, the, the person uh, who had approached me was a participant of uh, an online course of mine within the uh, Faculty of Law in, in Hanover. And um, she pointed out uh, how much she liked my course. It was a course uh, dealing with elements of uh, European law mainly. And uh, I have to say, I was uh, not only smitten, I was initially shocked, of course, uh, due to the fact that uh, I was being recognized despite wearing a mask in the supermarket. And I'm not living directly in Hanover uh, so that I could expect to, to meet uh, students. So um, uh, the, the feedback which I got there uh, uh, regarding uh, an online lecture which I uh, delivered was very special to me. And um, I have to say, um, since April 2020, of course, I also had my share of experience in uh, online lectures due to the situation, of course. Um, initially, my, uh, my uh, basic approach to, um, to teaching always, of course, due to my Greek roots, is a mere Socratic approach. I always try to use certain elements of the so-called meftiki uh, in order to uh, try to reach um, scientific truth through uh, successive questions towards the uh, lecture participants. And uh, it was possible to transfer that because I uh, consider uh, Socrates always of, of being up to date. Um, it was manageable to transfer this way of uh, uh, teaching also in the uh, online uh, lectures. We've heard in our very vivid discussion, uh, both the uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, online teaching. I'm also of the opinion that uh, the development of online teaching has come to stay at least um, supplementary. Uh, but in any case, this uh, technology, um, uh, this technological elements will stay with us. And um, having uh, our mind on 2022 onwards uh, and uh, the modern legal teaching, um, we will also have a proper eye on uh, collaborations, of course, which have been uh, made possible through pandemic situations, through the necessity of using online products. So uh, we have, of course, the, the joy to have our dear friend Melanie Reed here also with us. Um, it uh, started in the summer semester of 2020 with a very close collaboration with our dear partners in Lisbon and our dear partners in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, uh, in order to schedule so-called, uh, well, bilateral lectures in the first place between our 
faculties. And in the current semester, we have uh, managed to advance to advance to a certain, uh, well, even uh, more improved format, the format of the so-called ELPIS US Transatlantic Legal Lectures, which of course uh, combine lectures of uh, various lecturers, professors uh, from our partner universities in the US and uh, um, ELPIS uh, partner universities, of course. Um, and also uh, it was possible, of course, to have a lecture uh, with our dear friends from uh, from the Symbiosis Law School in Pune lately. So uh, merely not only a transatlantic legal lecture, but also, uh, <laughs> well, a format uh, bringing uh, together literally friends from around the world and lecturers from around the world. We are intending to keep doing that in the upcoming semesters, uh, ever trying to keep up doing the good work and to even enhance if that's if that is possible the the uh, the number of participants the number of lectures uh, that would be of course uh, something which uh, would also be helpful to bring elpis further to the next year 2022 and onwards as a factor of something which uh, has been developed through the necessity of pandemic and has come, of course, to, uh, to stay. Um, uh, for Hanover, uh, we have managed to integrate this uh, transatlantic league lecture in a certain course for our students, which is uh, to be delivered due to our Hanover curriculum, the so-called Elpis Colloquium. And uh, the Elpis Colloquium, of course, has been a, a fixed point in the curriculum of the uh, master's degree in European legal practice for a decade and a half already. Um, since the early 1980s and the beginnings of the Elpis yeah. program in Hanover and Athens and the Saloniki, uh, there already existed a corresponding event which at the same time quickly advanced to being a talent factory for aspiring young legal scholars from all over Europe, providing the participants with, a necessary, uh, with necessary legal information and always encouraging them to think out of the box to explore future possibilities of all kinds. And uh, we have managed to integrate for Hannover this Elpis US Transatlantic Legal Lectures, as it has been formed in the current semester within the Elpis Colloquium for the Hanover students. Um, therefore, combining tradition with uh, actually, yeah, the future. What uh, will um, elements which uh, Elpis will face in the years to come. And once more, I'd like to point out that um, the online products, which we were forced actually to use um, due to the pandemic situation, um, can be helpful. And in certain cases are necessary to keep going as for example, in our mutual uh, lecture series with our American friends, especially. Therefore, these elements or some of these elements have indeed come to stay and will be able to transfer, I guess, Elpis to the next, um, to the next year and to the uh, upcoming years. I'd like to conclude with a very nice idea of my dear friend Rui um, with the um, Elpis mood court, which you worded yesterday in our uh, meeting. That is a fabulous idea. Um, among all the other ideas, of course, uh, which have also been uh, expressed in yesterday's meeting and uh, are also uh, capable of bringing Elpis uh, to the next step. And um, especially the Elpis mood court, I kept that in mind, would be something that could start, well, not right away, but uh, in, uh, well, the upcoming semesters, and it could start in an online way, first of all, in order to be to be able to bring the participants from 
uh, different continents together. And it could, of course, then lead also to meetings in presence um, at the final stages of that Elpis Moot Court. But that is also something which, which could be, um, um, well, something that would bring Elpis towards the next step. So having these elements in mind, a combination of our uh, Elpis tradition and uh, using these elements of technology, which are indeed helpful and capable of bringing Elpis to the next level from 2022 onwards, having these elements in mind, I guess it is the safest to proceed. And I'd like to thank you warmly for your attention. Thank you, Dimitrius. Thank you so much for your most interesting intervention, as always. Uh, I will refrain from comments uh, and immediately give the floor to, uh, to everyone for questions and remarks uh, regarding both interventions or uh, any other aspect that you want to to highlight. Yes, uh, please. I have Andreas Farza first on my screen. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Rui. Uh, my first remark is to Aunt Kunike, uh, who presented, of course, a very uh, fine and smart uh, lecture uh, on lecturing. Um, but if I look to the pre class, stage and the after class stage. Uh, this is at the university, nothing new, uh, but traditionally we recommend to the students something they should do and they can decide if and how they prepare before and to, uh, yes, finish after the class. So I'm a little bit skeptical that using all these digital devices and the digital possibilities, if we are not restricting the students, uh, taking away their freedom, how to learn, and of course, taking away the freedom of teachers, how to teach. So I think this should be in mind if we go more into the digital world. And the other thing is, uh, well, I hope my uh, intervention in the last uh, part uh, has not uh, the impression or given the impression that I'm against uh, digital uh, things or digital methods or online learning or such things. But I think still the fundament and the basis of education within a university is person to person or face to face. Uh, and that of course is more uh, relevant if again, going back to Arndt Kunike, if we coach, if we support, or if we otherwise communicate with the students, of course you can do that over the internet. But I think, this is not the best way to do it. It helps us, of course. Um, and of course, I appreciate the possibilities of uh, the internet and all the digital world. As a musician and as a lover of music, I of course appreciate the possibilities to explore music over the internet. But to boil it down, the best way to have a musical experience is a live concert. And this is true even for learning and teaching at universities. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Um, I had, uh, Melanie Reed on my screen, but uh, I don't know if you still want to speak. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just was gonna, I really enjoyed 
your uh, the presentations aren't in Demetrios. You guys did a great job. I, I just wanted to comment that I feel that we have a very difficult job as professors in this age because I think the way that we learned uh, is very different and we spent our free time differently even than the students of today because I think we have to embrace the fact that we live in a digital world and the students that we teach, I mean, they spend their time on Snapchat and TikTok and have very short attention spans that are used to going from texting to, you know, looking at these different apps. And so I think that we have to kind of embrace it in the sense of we have to use it not necessarily solely as a as a factor of teaching but use it as a way to improve or or help them learn because i i think when art was talking about his um app idea love it i think that's great and i think that the studies show that information moves from short-term memory to long-term memory if we use a spaced repetition concept. So we can use technology to assist us in having our students go from the short-term listening it to it once in a lecture to having an app where they're consistently throughout the semester having to re relearn that material and then it and then it moves into that long-term memory. So I think I, I as much as I sometimes resist this digital world and the fact that they're learning things from YouTube videos instead of reading like I learned, um, trying to use that and incorporate that into our classes as an additional um, to support their learning because that's kind of how they're doing it now. I mean, that's why experiential learning is, is so important now because they're used to, um, you know, going back and forth, collaborating, and they have friends that they've never even met before in person. Like they have friends online and they have, um, you know, now they have these these robots that you can actually like um, digital robots that that are your friends, but that are not like actual people. I mean, it's just it's kind of mind blowing. But I guess what I'm saying is, is how awesome would it be if we followed on Art's idea of creating like some sort of Elpis master app, right? That would have questions that they'd have to ask every day to themselves for like five minutes, because right, they have short attention spans to learn the material, to move into that long-term um, learning in their, in their brain. So I really enjoyed these and I, and I really look forward to future collaborations to kind of exploring how we can, how we can add to our courses. So thank you. Thanks uh, so much. Uh, it seems that we are quickly uh, moving towards uh, well, there are ideas for a different um, help is core business with uh, apps and uh, moot courts. Uh, so times are changing and we seem to have ideas to, uh, to get along with it. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> any more comments, remarks, questions, please? Uh, Arndt, yes. Thank you. So uh, I, I just want to, to, to emphasize that these the digital means or electronics means also according to, to my experience and opinion should just be supplementary, complementary to, to the normal things. But um, to, two of my main experiences, especially also with distance teaching are the following. The most important for the students is that they can reach the teacher somehow, no matter how, if they can go to your office hours or if they can contact you somehow, by electronic means, the, the, the main point is when the student works on a certain topic that he or she has access to the teacher. And this is the idea of providing an app because then once you, you provide all this information, but the student can access anytime, anywhere, just not need to, to wait till, for example, today is Saturday, next week, Tuesday, when there's a new office hour of the teacher. This is not modern anymore, and this uh, needs to be um, definitely changed. And the other thing is, um, I guess, also very important for us from the 
teacher's side is that we keep authentic. Not everybody is up to certain teaching styles. When you go to university, enter different classrooms, all different teaching styles. You have to find your own way. And if you're not that familiar and um, keen on, on using these electronic means, leave it. Then uh, it, it doesn't make really sense because the students immediately will notice that somebody is using Instagram but without using the right filters and not having any idea how to, to place him or herself in the, the picture the best way. So um, each of us needs to find its, his or her own way, I guess. Important is to be available, accessible for the students, but in a way you also feel comfortable with. This is what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? <clears throat> May I? Yes, please. Uh, Professor Tineke, thank you very much for your well uh, elaborated program. This is really very effective. Uh, he's gone out of the room, so there is no use to put the question anymore. So let me put a question to the Dimitris. Uh, you mentioned uh, Socrates and Socrates used to say moderation in all things. Is this to understand uh, in the future that we will have a hybrid system, moderation in all things? How do you think about that? Well, thank you very much, dear professor, for the uh, very to the point question. I think that uh, the approach of uh, Socrates um, can be used, and I have, <laughs> well, tried to use it in, in, in lectures in presence, in hybrid lectures and in online ones. And um, the only difference is that in, in the online situation, you are not always capable of seeing the faces of the participants, which would help to, uh, to get to a certain necessary level of, inter uh, level of interaction. Um, but uh, in these cases in which the cameras are on, even in the online situation, in my uh, uh, humble experience, uh, my uh, trying to, to um, getting to uh, answers through questions has proved to be uh, effective in, in the groups in which I had the opportunity to to, to teach. Therefore, my answer would be that the approach as uh, the, the holistic approach uh, would be um, fitting, even in the year 2022, of course, uh, regardless the, the way of uh, uh, or the mode of uh, the class in which you are, be it online or uh, hybrid or uh, yeah, in presence. Right. Thank you. Now I see Professor Kineke is uh, in the room. Back, may I ask you something, Professor Kineke? Uh, one of the most important moments in the life of the students is, as we know, the exam. How do you think about that, digitally or in another way? You have given us a system of teaching, but we have the exams at the end and after half a century, I have the feeling that students are very interesting at the end on the exams. How do you think about that? Yeah, that, that that's a big question. Thank you for, for asking. So what do we prepare the students for? To, to be able to freely think, to use the, the legal tools for solving cases or just to learn something by heart, like uh, some of you um, just mentioned, uh, explaining this exam period uh, when somebody just wrote down uh, five pages learned by heart. Um, I'm not a friend of uh, online exams because there it's, it's mostly checking just knowledge and how can you really control that the students have this knowledge on their own or just take it from their mobile phones, their, their smart apps, uh, their smart um, watches or whatever. So um, I guess that the main task is really to provide the students um, different means of material, preparing them for this 
old style exam, but the question is, um, yeah, if for the long run, there also needs to be something adjusted in the way how we do the exams, but um, having taught at different universities all over Europe, um, the technique of making exams is also different. For example, thinking back to my Turkish times is just reproducing knowledge. They would learn by heart the, the textbook. And if you ask any question not being um, included in the textbook, they would be lost. So this kind of learning I would not support. But of course, try to support the students. Take um, the things, the tools, apart from or in addition to the knowledge they need for the exams from different sources and also check that they use some, some decent tools, some, some decent sources, because that's the other part of the idea I had, creating some app. When you create an app for your own course, at least you have it in your hands, what kind of information is provided to the students, because I had it so many times that they said, oh, teacher, I found something in the internet on YouTube or whatever, but it's completely nonsense. But nobody helps them to um, pick the, the valuable sources and erase the unvaluable so short answer, yes, in favor of still written exams in presence, but trying to assist them providing knowledge and additional sources also online. Well, uh, I would like to be a student, but unfortunately I am not. Uh, if I had the opportunity to follow your, your system, which is the digital teaching, very good in my mind, excellent. My question would be, at the end, in a physical exam, would I have the right to have my computer with me to go to the internet? No, of course not. Not at all. Not Why, not? Artist, Why, not? Yeah. Why not? Those informations are open to everybody. Why not? I would like, of course, you say no. But I say, why not? A problem must be approached by all ways we have all means we have now and the digital means are there. Everything um, is there. So we have to, 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 to find out, uh, to, to search in the computer in, in everything and to give an answer in the same way in which we, we, we could give an answer in our office or not. A question I also asked myself, sorry, if I can quickly, quickly answer. Many times when I was still a student, we had to learn so many definitions by heart using them in the first state exam, in the second state exam, you, we could use the commentaries and everything was uh, available beside us. So that's the big question. I cannot change any system just by giving my classes. It's the change of the whole expectations from uh, the, the legal sphere. What do we want the students to learn? Do we want them to be able to access everything? Then I'm with you. Let them also use all that stuff during the exams. Or do we want them at least to have some, some basic knowledge on their own hard disk, then uh, they still need to learn certain things and uh, they are not allowed to, to use these digital means during their exams. Yes, it's a, uh, something very, if we give the uh, informations or if we give methods, way of thinking, different approaches to the same problem and at the end, we see the interest which are playing in this solution, uh, the main or the most important role, and to ask, is this the important role or not? I, I think this is a way of, uh, of working, of approaching things nowadays. And according to my opinion, we, I, at least me, I have not the right to stop young students to have two gang and to access. <laughs> to, yeah, approach to access to, to access to the digital information. They live with this. They are born with this. They they must have it. Of course, uh, this is a new generation. Even if I am not in the position to understand that well, I must. Respect that. This is another area now. We have to see that. Excuse me, as a Greek professor, I am very enthusiastic about my ideas, uh, even if they are very poor. But this is the way of thinking. Um, excuse me for that. Thank you.
We still have uh, a question from Andrea Schwarza, and I believe now another one from Dimitra. Uh, and possibly after this, we could uh, close the panel. And Professor Vashk wants to intervene as well. Okay, so three interventions. Andreas, please. Yes, uh, to the let to the last point of discussion. Uh, of course, you can uh, test the students with different exams. So either you can say, okay, they have no open book, no open internet, no open world. So they have to say what they know by heart, what are the structures and so on. So this is one kind of examination. And the other kind of examination is you give them, let's say a practical case and they can use the internet and all the other sources to solve this case. And if you look to German legal education, we have these two phases. At the university exam, you have no open book, no internet, and so on. But then after the referendariat, you can use all the sources. You can look to commentaries and so on. So I think these are two stages of examination. And I'm a little bit skeptical to give the students at the beginning of their studies or during their early studies uh, open book exams. And the other thing is, this is to Arndt Königke, uh, of course, written exams I would like to have in presence. Um, you said why, because cheating and so on. Uh, but if you have oral exams, I think it's possible to do that online over the internet. So this is a little bit more uh, possible than with written exams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dimitra, please. Yes, I have also a remark to the last point. I remember my time as a student. Uh, we had a professor at the University of Thessaloniki, Professor Margaritis. He uh, was a, our lecturer for criminal procedure and he was very innovative at the time because he allowed us to bring all our books to the examination. So we went to the university with a lorry load of uh, books. Uh, and I remember it was the most difficult question, uh, the most uh, difficult exam I had because it depends on how you put uh, the questions to the students. Uh, so uh, of course you can provide the students with the material, but you have to ask the question um, differently. Thank you. And Professor Vashk, please. Yes, that's another topic we should discuss more intensively, the question of assessment. There is a problem, especially in Germany. One of the reasons why the German <coughs> did not accede to the uh, Erasmus uh, 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 combined uh, uh, process of Bologna was because in the field of law, there was the uh, exam, the final exam, the state exam. But the state exam is the model of an exam that proved very well, but it's not. it cannot be the only way of assessment. The assessment must be combined. Open questions, oral examinations, uh, uh, mood cards, papers, everything must be combined in the way of assessment. We should combine these new techniques, also techniques of teaching in new techni techniques of assessment. And something that's something that we should put in our agenda to discuss probably in the next conference or in, or in the next meeting, because there are so many things that we can do in order to assess coming from quiz games to uh, complicated uh, papers uh, to uh, exams mixing oral and written parts, oral exams mixing the, the, the simulated cases. Well, there's a, a universe of solutions that we should discuss and that the students are asking us to try them because they are also innovative and they are very important. I, uh, I'll, I'll give 
Rui Guerra da Fonseca uh, now the world, but I would like in the end to make a final con consideration. And I think that uh, we should close this uh, marathon, uh, uh, a real marathon on discussing of, of pedagog pedagogic themes, but that was really very interesting and uh, with different opinions that created a great, uh, uh, a great fun, but at least a great uh, uh, intellectual uh, pleasure. And, uh, and also it was very fruitful for our task as professor. Rui, up Thank to you with the panel. <laughs> Thank you, professor. This is just really to close the panel. I would like to uh, thank uh, both Arndt and Dimitrius for their interventions. Of course, thank everyone for their questions and remarks. My last words is, of course, to uh, Professor Fenge again uh, in this uh, uh, important uh, circumstance. And uh, I give the floor back to Professor Vasco Pereira Silva to uh, well to whatever he sees fit <laughs> thank you very much well we are here from uh, 9 30 8 30 in portugal 10 30 in greece we have been discussing for more than four hours uh, ride intensively uh, new ways of teaching and old ways of teaching and uh we combined different generations. Uh, uh, Rui talked about four generations. In the beginning, I was thinking in three, but as a matter of fact, we are already four generations. Uh, that comes from our papi, Professor Fenga and his colleagues that created the Alpes project. Then it comes to the younger generation, those that we formed, and then now are also teaching and have new ideas. And in the middle, we have two different generations that are all together. And that's the, the important thing that we learn in Elpis, that we should combine all the views and all the methods and try to get the best from all generations, from all the ways of teaching, because we are in a never ending task. A test that is the most beautiful task in the world. That is learning and teaching, teaching and learning. That's the wonderful experience that we are doing in our lives, that we are doing for, for centuries from the Socratic methods, the old Socratic methods to the new Socratic methods with uh, 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 an European tendency or an American tendency, we are always recreating the way of doing the same thing, the same task of teaching and learning. And that is the best thing that we could do. And I believe that for Professor Penga, the best way of honor him was talking about this, having him here, and having all the people that uh, followed him, all these new generations that appeared, some that he formed, some that he met, some other that are youngest, and combine all this thing together means that help is as a future, help is, is a hope, and we keep on doing this. And uh, to finish it, I don't know if you want to have the last word, my dear friend Ilma. <laughs> you see, Professor Silva, this is the tragic of digitalization. I can digitally participate to the party, but I cannot at all enjoy a German Belectus brought. That is a tragic situation. Lieber Hilma, bleibe gesund und weiter machen. And we are all there. I will do my very best. <laughs> I will do my very best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank well, thank next you time, thank you. next time in Fribourg, we will have not just a, a, a 
well, lunch and dinner, but we also have the visit to the chocolate factory uh, and to the Gruyere factory. So we will have time also to be together, to join our, our, our presence and to make also a party of teaching and learning, which is what we are doing now. Thank you very much. It was a good experience. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed it. And see you. Uh, have a nice Christmas and a Happy New Same Year. To you. And uh, to you. See, you. Everybody. see you in the next uh, video emission and in person <laughs> in, in free work in May. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice time, Christmas and New Year. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Professor Fenger. Um, yeah. Uh, you get the regards of Chris Bartolts. I told him about this uh, homage to you, and unfortunately, he could not be, uh, he could not participate. And of course, he has retired um, time ago, but still, he wanted to uh, give his best regards to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. It was a pleasure. It was, it was a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lieber Hilmar, es war sehr schön, dich wenigstens auf dem Bildschirm zu sehen und dich zu hören. Das hat mir gut gefallen. Das sollten wir vielleicht ab und zu mal machen, wenn wir uns schon nicht persönlich sehen, dass wir mal eine kleine Videokonferenz abhalten. Ähm, natürlich wäre ich auch sehr daran interessiert, dich mal wieder face to face zu sehen, also persönlich zu treffen, aber Weihnachten werden wir jetzt nicht nach Hannover kommen, vielleicht kommen wir über Silvester und wenn da Zeit ist und wenn du verfügbar bist, dann könnten wir uns vielleicht kurz mal treffen. Ansonsten hoffen wir, dass es dann Eine bald sehr wird. gute Idee. Eine sehr gute Idee, lieber Andreas, dass man sich vielleicht auf diese Weise wieder sieht und wenn du nach Hannover kommst, du bist immer willkommen, deine Mutter ist ja noch da und äh, Ich hoffe, wir sehen uns bald wieder mal. Das hoffe ich auch, ja. Also bleib vor allen Dingen wohl auf. Bleib so interessiert und aktiv, wie du immer warst und weiterhin bist. Und äh, wünsche dir schöne Weihnachten erstmal und auch einen guten Rutsch. Und auf bald dann mal wieder. Dasselbe dir und deiner Familie. Alles Gute. Danke für deine Familie natürlich auch. Alles Gute. Hm. Habt ein schönes Weihnachten. Tschüss, wiedersehen.